hello good evening everyone i hope all of you are in uh, good health alhamdulillah so uh, today our uh, discussion will be uh, the clinical neurology okay uh, as we decided in our group that we will discuss the neurology chapter so that's why any suggestion before starting the session if anyone wants to talk anything we can discuss okay and after uh, reading each topic if any volunteer we will practice if no volunteer we will go to the next topic okay and i can be the role player i can be the candidate no issue anyone wants to practice they are most welcome okay just be prepared that you are going to practice with us so that uh, uh, i mean it will be like a exam uh, situation we will do the this practice like 9 minute uh, 6 minute station and uh, we will try to uh, practice now face now the online format like uh, the uh, distance uh, computerized exam because till now we don't have any uh, idea how the face to face exam is going to be uh, but we know that online exam is going on so we will practice now like online so everything you have to speak like uh, what cranial nerve you want to examine how you will examine what will be the finding okay uh, during this 6 minute clinical station uh, i will uh, try to uh, speak that i will uh, tell the child command and also i will tell the finding together i will not wait for the examiner to talk okay like this so this child this is a first case uh, neurology chapter uh, so this child presents with a, an unusual appearance examine the child's cranial nerve so this stosis in the right eye this is a very common exam scenario we uh, we know from the previous exam like the previous candidates when they give uh, our uh, us feedback we know that cranial nerve examination, especially tosis and nerve uh, related to the eye examination is very important. Okay, so this is very important. And the one thing is I cannot, uh, I cannot see the chat in the laptop. I am on the laptop, so better if you speak, everyone, okay? Don't chat on the uh, chat box because from my laptop, it is very difficult if I open the chat, chat box. Okay, now this is the child uh, who presents with an unusual appearance. Examine this child's cranial nerve. So overall, the child was tall and thin. Okay, this is the face of the child. Now, we know during any clinical station, what we do? We first enter the room, we gel our hands or uh, any with any moisture, any, uh, if there is a sanitizer, we will sanitize our hand. If there is no sanitizer, we will... Uh, wash our hands or hexisol there will be hexi scrub anything and then uh, i will introduce myself with the examiner that hello uh, good evening i am dr tamanna one of the candidate of today's exam and then the examiner will give me the command that this is a 10 year old or looks like this child looks like five year old so this is a five year old child and he presented with some unusual features on the face so please examine the child's cranial nerves. Okay, thank you very much. I will greet the examiner. I will thank the examiner. And then I'll go to the mother and the child. I will greet the mother. Hello, mom. Uh, how are you today? And what's his name? So the mom will ask that his name is John, suppose, or um, anything. And then I will tell I am Dr. Tamanna, one of the examiner, one of the examinee today. So uh, I will examine John uh, for some, uh, I will do some tests. Uh, is it okay? So I'll take permission from the mother and I will greet John also. Hello, John, how are you? Okay, uh, what a nice shirt, I can say. What a nice shirt you are wearing. So this is the repo. So first of all, wiper. We all know this is the, yeah, let me draw. So we all know what is wiper, right? W, I, P, E and R. So this is wiper. Dr. Tahir said very good. Dr. Tahir, are you here? Can you just again remind us wiper? You made a very good note of this wiper. 
I think uh, he's busy. Okay, anyone can uh, remind us what is wiper? W for uh, washing your hand. Yes. I for introduce yourself. Yes. B for permission. B for permission, yes. Uh, e empathy. E for empathy also, you can say, but exposure. Expose at the part of the if if it is chest expose the chest if it is abdomen expose the abdomen like this exposure. Mm. Or I think for repo. Yes, R for repo. Yes, good, very good. Any anything empathy you can also say, permission you can also say. So this is wiper our uh, menomic. We have to remember this first when you enter the room. This is the most important important you know starting, because if the starting is uh, not good. Then hold the station, you will feel bad. Hold of the station, you will feel bad that I did not greet the mother, I did not wrap up with the child. So whole of the station will be like you are sad. Um, these things, because I know these things, because I gave exam in last, um, last February. And uh, when I was practicing, sometimes I forgot to greet the mother. Or, so this feels, you know, very bad when you don't greet. Hello, good evening or good morning. How are you, mom? How are you, John? These things makes very good inside. And then after wiper, you have to look carefully the surrounding, very important. So after wiper, we have what? We have 4D and S. Now anyone can remind what is 4D and S? This is also very easy. Anyone? Yeah. Uh, uh, D, there is D for uh, dimension. Yes, dimension money, growth, height, weight like this. You will yes. see that. Is tall and thin, so this dimension, yeah. Then one for devices, one for devices, like there can be anula at us, there can be salbutamol inhaler. The child devices, like the child has some, uh, you know, central catheter or nasal catheter, anything like a, a spectacle, okay, like um, spectacle of eyes. So, any device attached with the child, there may yes. be a shunt, shunt in the brain for hydrocephalus, anything. This is device, yeah, then? Distress. Distress, yeah. That means the child is in cyanosis or in distress or in pain or in respiratory distress or maybe the child is temporary. Child has maybe the child is a pain, is in pain. So pain, respiratory distress, cyanosis and temperature and any fracture. I mean, any kind of distress mental or physical, any kind of distress. The child may be anxious. This is also distress. You have to say the examiner that the child looks anxious, frightened. Okay, that's, the, that's why the child did not allow me to examine him. So this is also your finding. The child was anxious, crying. This is distress. Uh, last one, I don't know, maybe this small uh, feature. Uh, good evening, uh, um, everyone. Okay, good evening. Yeah, Dr. Taman, I'm really sorry. Actually, I had a patient with me. No, uh, so, uh, no problem, no problem. Yeah. Just uh, we're discussing the 4DS. So Dr. Tamim uh, finished 4D. One is uh, yeah. dimension. Another is uh, device, distress, and D for last D for dysmorphism, right? Dysmorphism. If in the face there is any dysmorphic feature, you see. And S for surrounding. Surrounding money, wheelchair, shoe. In case of neurology, we have to see the shoe, the wheelchair. So these things like wiper, 4DS, you will take hardly one minute. Okay, introduction, wrap up, permission, all the things will be done side by side. You know, you are washing the hand and you are introducing yourself. You are taking permission at the same time, you are exposing the child. You are making wrap at the same time. And at the same time, you look the surrounding that there is no device attached, there is nothing. And you saw the dysmorphism. Here in this child, I can see the child is tall and thin, not in pain or distress, not cyanosed. The child's dimension is overall, growth is overall, and the child does not have any device attached. And no dysmorphism, but there is a drooping of the upper eyelid of the right side. So that means the child has tosses on the right side. This we can see. Now from the inspection, we can see right-sided tosses, face is otherwise symmetrical. Why they are asking this thing? Because if the nasolabial fluid, 
if the nasolabial fold is uh, obliterated flat it it indicate which nerve palsy facial nerve palsy but in facial nerve palsy there will be wide open eyelid not drooping okay uh, facial nerve palsy and uh, oculomotor nerve palsy they are opposite but oculomotor nerve palsy will be confused by the myasthenia or horner syndrome these are the confusing of oculomotor because all the cases of ptosis but facial nerve and oculomotor nerve are reverse one is wide open of the eye that is facial nerve another is ptosis that is oculomotor nerve so the nasolabial fold is intact means they are saying there is no facial nerve injury no myoclonic facies this is not myoclonic this is myotonic facies okay that there is spelling mistake so this is not myoclonic myotonic facies that means the child is not myotonic dystrophy position of the head chin up raised eyebrow why this is why this is positioning of the head raised eyebrow chin up to uh, compensate to compensate yeah very very good fantastic yes because yeah. when you have tosis yeah. very good my god this point i totally missed yeah so when there is tosis like fourth nerve injury like third nerve injury fourth nerve injury the child is head tilted why the head tiltation tilting because of the you know the compensate and head tilting will be in which side head tilting will be in the good side okay because the child cannot see from the bad side so head tilting will be in the good side and like this here to compensate the dro drooping of the eyelid there will be head, chin up and raised eyebrow the child is trying to look from the tosis eyelid okay so very good yes dr kamin thank you very much this kind of discussions are very helpful okay because you are helping each other's knowledge okay please try to speak up in the meeting thank you thank yeah, you yeah very good very good now inspection now you will do vision vision mane able to see fingers so first of all as this is a cranial nerve examination of the eye so which nerve mainly we will test number 1 is optic oculomotor trochlear then facial then abducens facial these things we will look because these these are related with the eye so inspection of the face we did now vision check vision check means first the child is blind or not able to see finger can you able to see my finger okay then how many finger is this if the child is can count like this child is 5 year so he can count two finger three finger but if the child is like two year three year he cannot count okay then uh, able to finger count then if the child follow the command then he will do h shape test for double vision h shape test h shape test we know we start from the midline then go to the right then ups and downs then go to the left ups and downs so at which point i will tell the child tell me that when you can see double finger at that point please let me know if there is double vision that's at, at the extreme point the child will say yes i can see two finger but this is very very important to know that this kind of command the child will follow after 6 years before 6 years it is very difficult to follow the command then extraocular movement i am seeing in the h shape manner the child can see or not that there is any diplopia so the diplopia double vision and the h shape movement 3 4 6 nerve testing is same okay when you are doing the h shape movement you are checking the 3 4 6 nerve all the extraocular and intraocular muscles are activated when you are doing h shape movement and at the same time you will ask the child that when you see the double finger please let me know okay that's why when you have h shape movement you will stop 5 3 second at least 3 second to give the child time if you do hurriedly you know if you do hurriedly then the child you will miss and another important point if the child has nystagmus nystagmus he will start to show the sign if you are doing the extreme right or extreme left movement h shape movement the child will have nystagmus nystagmus means abnormal jerky movement of the irish right there is a jerking of the pupil so this nystagmus you can see by this h shape movement so h shape movement is very important by this h shape movement 
we can see three things. Number one is cranial nerve, three, four, six. Number two is diplopia, double vision. Number three is nystagmus. Am I correct until now, Dr. Tahir or anyone? By age shape movement, we can identify these things, right? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now, size of the pupil, two millimeter, two to three millimeter. This is the physiological size, two to three millimeter. So any deviation from this two to three millimeter is called pathological. Suppose more than four millimeter, this is dilatation, mydriasis. Less than two millimeter, this is meiosis. Okay, so two to three millimeter is the physiological size of the pupil. So see the size of the pupil and see the reaction, pupillary reaction. So now this point, you will focus the torch light. First at the glabella. Why at the glabella? First at this point, you will focus the torch like here in this point. In this point, this is called the glabella. Why this point? To see this. You can, can you see my drawing? This is the glabella. At this point, you will focus the torch light to see that is there any, um, any uh, malalignment? I mean, the torch light. See the figure here. Uh, let me enlarge the figure. See this figure, this figure child has center. Okay, these light reflex are central. Both the, both the light reflex is in the pupil. So there is no, no what, no deviation. That means there is no squint, right? So this child has no squint. If there is squint, the eyeball, this light reflex will uh, go either medially or laterally. If it goes medially, then there is a lateral deviation, I mean, external squint. This is called what? This is called what? Squint's another name is? I forgot. <laughs> Divergent squint. Yeah, sorry. Divergent squint. Divergent squint. Convergent and divergent, yes. Mm -hmm. So if it is medial, that means it is divergent squint, lateral deviation. If it is lateral, that means the pupil is medially diverted. So it is convergent squint, okay? So the seeing the light, you can see is it in the um, lateral deviation or medial deviation? So which nerve is pulsy? If it is abducent nerve pulsy, then there will be medial deviation in convergent squint. If it is uh, oculomotor nerve pulsy, then there will be eyeball will be down and out. So there will be divergent squint. Clear? So now this light reflex. So at the same time, when I am putting the light on the glabella, I see there is squint or not. And then at the same time, I will uh, put, I will torch the light into the, suppose, right eye, here, here. If the pupil constrict, it is direct light reflex. So the direct light reflex is intact on the left eye. Then I will put one finger into the nose of the child. I will put, or I will tell the child or mom, mom, can you put the hand uh, on this nose for me? Thank you. Then mom will put the hand. And then I will see the consensual or indirect light reflex on the opposite eye. If the direct and consensual light reflex is intact, that means which two nerve is okay? Optic and oculomotor. These two nerves are okay. Okay, that means the direct and consensual both are okay. Now the same thing I will do on the, on the right eye. So the right eye, I, I will see the direct light reflex. Then I will do again, I will put a hand on, mid, on the midline, on the nose, and I will see the consensual light reflex on the opposite eye. So if the, they are intact, that means the left, right-sided oculomotor and optic both are intact. So this is the light reflex, direct and consensual, both are intact. I hope this much is clear for all, right? Now, the cranial nerve, we already we started examining we examine the optic we examine the oculomotor three four six by h shape movement we saw the pupillary light reflex now what is next cranial nerve five intact seven intact eight intact nine ten eleven twelve intact how you will examine this cranial nerve how by five who can tell us five how we will examine the five what is the role of cranial nerve five in the eye anyone any volunteer? Five. What is the role of cranial nerve five? Triseminal. Corneal reflex. Corneal yeah. only, only one thing, corneal reflex. I think there is nothing more work, right? So can anyone tell us how we will see corneal reflex? Yeah. 
we can touch with a wisp of cotton at the lateral side of the eye i yes yes we usually don't do this thing right we don't do but uh, but we, we have to check and which two nerve involved this cranial nerve 5 i mean the trigeminal nerve which two nerve is involved 5 and 7 5 and 7 okay. i'm not sure anyone dr tahir 5 and 7 uh, yes, sorry yes. what is the question or corneal reflex i mean the 5 how we will test the 5 you will touch a cotton on the lateral limbus and it will you know there will be reflex so this reflex is involved in 5 and 7 yeah i think blinking of the eye yes yes five yes you're five. right yes so 5 is for trigeminal sensory right five, and 7 is motor facial nerve is motor okay so motor. this is dr tamanna sorry to interrupt you trigeminal is also in a motor no we will also clenching and also this mastic also motor element uh, component is there and yes. we maxillary mandibular three branches we apart from corneal cornea we don't uh, this uh, uh, elicit uh, in routine but uh, examination purpose we have touch on three area cheek mandible maxillary mandibular uh, three areas we have uh, got check for this sensation and yes. also trigeminal as, as well as motor component also motor component is jaw reflex tapping of the tapping of the no, jaw uh, yeah it's two, it it has two component motor and sensory motor uh, for t- testing the motor <coughs> component of the crane lens we mm-hmm. ask the child to close his jaw or clench mm-hmm. his teeth yes. and then oh. we palpate the temporal uh, temporalis muscles and masseter muscles if it yeah. is tense then it means that fifth cranial nerve motor component is intact Okay. and for the sensory component it has three uh, part uh, ophthalmic maxillary and mandibular division and mm-hmm. we can test the sensation by week of cotton in respective area yes <clears throat> and uh, just for theoretical person we will ask uh, mm-hmm. to the examiner that after the completion of this all cranial nerves that <clears throat> uh, at the end we can tell that uh, i would like to complete my examination by doing the corneal re- reflexes but we okay. don't have to try it in the midway yeah <clears throat> oh, very good very good so i am asking this especially for theoretical this corneal reflex involve the sensory component of trigeminal nerve and motor component of facial nerve right yes yes yeah okay so this is clear now everyone that trigeminal nerve has two component it is a mixed nerve a 3 4 6 they are purely motor optic is purely sensory okay olfactory optic they are purely sensory and also vestibulo cochlear eight one two eight these three nerves are purely sensory and then three four six this is purely motor three four six that is uh, abdus uh, oculomotor uh, olfactory optic oculomotor trochlear and abducens it's purely motor and uh, five seven they are purely they are they are mixed five seven Okay, and nine, ten, nine, ten. I think nine, ten also uh, purely mixed. Yeah. Mixed, 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 mixed. mixed. In just Vegas, okay, mixed. In just Vegas, also mixed. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tamanna, here I want to say that, like to say that that means uh, trigeminal has three branch: ophthalmic, mm. maxillary, and mandible. Ophthalmic and maxillary are purely motor. Mandible yeah. has two component rather. It has sensory portion, and the motor is from the mandibular division only. So all the muscles supplying the mu- muscle of mastication, they are basically the mandibular division. Okay. Yes. Yes. Ophthalmic mm-hmm. and maxillary are purely motor. Motor as the two component. Yes. Mag- 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 uh, mandibular has motor function. All the muscles of mastications. Another is sen- sensory. Which one is sensory for the mandibular? Yes, it is the sensation from the lower part of the face below the uh-huh. jaw. Means the, uh, okay. below the angle of the mouth. Okay. Below the angle of the mouth. Uh, mm-hmm. for the upper portion ophthalmic it is just from the angle of the eye and middle is between the angle of the eye the angle of the mouth and below portion is ang- uh, below the angle of the mouth ah very so good so this yeah. is the symptoms from, yeah so from here like from here to hmm. here this is ophthalmic this is maxillary and this is mandibular so this yes. portion is purely sensory we do the hmm. sensation hmm. from the hmm. teeth sensation from the skin also sensation from the cornea and this is also purely sensory maxillary this from the skin sensation and this is the mandibular uh, 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 not only skin maxillary also from the nasal mucosa 
uh -huh. mandibular from the oral mucosa. Okay, uh -huh. okay. Okay, so this mandibular has two branches. One is mm -hmm. uh, motor, that is for mm -hmm. the cell of mastication or uh, motor function. And another is skin, also the mouth. Mm -hmm. Mouth. Mucous membrane mm -hmm. of the mouth. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And muscle of mastication by the clenching of the jaw. We will clench the jaw and then uh, we will feel, touch the muscles so that I will see the tense. If the muscles are floppy, muscles looks you know floppy then we can understand that there is some pathology low, lower motor and if the muscles are very stiff or there is deviation of the mouth mandible then there is upper motor in the upper motor always muscles are stiff in the lower motor muscles are flaccid okay so this is our cranial nerve 5 here in this child we have to remember that though the child has tosis so the main problem pathology is in the eye but the command is examine the child's cranial nerve did not say related to the eye if they say related to the eye then i will not do my muscle of mastication i will not do like five tests but they said examine the cranial nerve that means you have to examine all the 12 cranial nerve here but the in the real exam actually they give command like this this child has some unusual features for last three days. Examine the child's cranial nerve related to the eye. Then only you will examine like this much. And for the five, you will say that I want to do corneal reflex. But the examiner will say no need because this is a painful procedure. So we don't do this thing. Now, what is the test for the cranial nerve seven? Who can remind us? Anyone can remind us? Seven. Uh, it's seven has two component, um, okay. motor and sensory. And for the motor component, uh, we have to test three moments like furrowing of eyebrows, puffing of cheek, and a mm -hmm. smile, or we can say, uh, show your teeth. Okay. These are the three moments for that uh, motor component. And for the sensory component, uh, it, it supplies sensory uh, sensation to the um, entire two third of the tongue. So okay. we can ask for the test. Test sensation, but also we will not do this in exam hall. But uh, theoretically, I will say that I want to do the, the test sensation in the anterior two third of the tongue. This is the sensory component, and for facial movement, that is the frowning, winching, then you know, puffing, then blowing, whistling, and teething, showing the teeth. All this movement, laughing, showing the teeth, blowing, whistling, frowning. Okay, these are the movement of the facial muscles. Okay, so two component facial nerve also. Uh, is there uh, Dr. Tamana, just, uh, um, just got free. I will just add on one or two things with your permission. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there is a simple uh, uh, formula uh, if someone wants to learn about the pure motor. The H shape uh, eye muscle function, the nerve which are involved, like three, four, and six, mm -hmm. plus the last two cranial nerves, they are pure motor. Yes, three, four, six, 11, 12. Mm. Yeah, and the rest are mixed. Yes. So th th this is the simple uh, formula I made. Um, regarding the fifth nerve, uh, I'd like to add a few things regarding the fifth. Yeah, there are three parts, the motor sensory, um, as you said, the ophthalmic, the ma maxillary, and the mandibular. Uh, but the motor part, uh, there are a few tests which we can do in the motor part. Uh, we attended a class with uh, Dr. Pankaj, and it was a very good one. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of two, one or two guys are still here in this meeting. Um, you need to check the pterygoid function. This is very, very important. And how to check the function of the pterygoid? Mm -hmm. um, you can check it by asking the patient, can you open your mouth, please? So yeah. if you open the mouth, uh, if there is weakness, so there will be deviation of the jaw towards the weak side. Towards the weak side, yes, yeah. yes. That's what I'm saying, lower motor neuron pulse, yes. Yes. Uh, the second thing which you can do is that uh, you put your hand on the pterygoid muscle and mm -hmm. uh, let's suppose you put on the right cheek and ask him to uh, that, that uh, uh, just do it against my hand resistance. Oh. Just push your head toward that side. So on the weaker side, it, it will be definitely felt that that side is weaker one. Weaker one, yes. Yeah. The, th the third test, which is uh, someone told even, is that to clinch your teeth tightly. It's not like the one show me your teeth what we do in the seventh nerve, it is clinch your teeth, like hold it tight against each other. 
so, so you will just palpate the muscle and we'll just check the tone of the two pterygoids on the side mm, pterygoid yeah. pterygoid yeah. and mesotery and the last one is uh, the jaw jerk which jerk. Uh, always we forget it uh, you'll just give command to just open uh, your mouth and i'll just uh, gently tap on your chin and it will not hurt mm. so uh, when you no, you put your yeah. thumb yeah you will put your thumb on the mentum of the jaw the middle mm -hmm. portion of the jaw and you'll just stroke your thumb stroke your uh, thumb. yeah if there is exaggerated uh, like response so it, it this is usually a pseudo bulbar palsy pseudo -bulbar simple bulbar. as that yes bulbar is the lower motor and pseudo bulbar is the upper motor uh, upper upper motor yeah. yeah yes so this is our uh, test whole complete test for the so for again, so sum up the uh, cranial nerve five, that is trizeminal. First, we have to check the sensory function and we will offer the cranial, uh, corneal reflex, but we will not do. Then we will to tell the child to open the mouth in the resistance, okay? And it will see the deviation of the jaw. Okay, if there is injury, there will be deviation. Upper motor neuron injury, opposite side deviation, lower motor injury, same side deviation. And another is you will clench the teeth and you will palpate the muscles. This is also the palpation is also a part of the mus muscular function of the cranial nerve five. And lastly, the jaw jerk. Jaw jerk will be exaggerated in upper motor neuron that is pseudo bulbar palsy and jaw jerk will be diminished in the lower motor neuron palsy. This is called bulbar palsy, bulb, bulb of the medulla that is the lower motor. Okay, fine. Now the cranial nerve seven motor and secret uh, sense, uh, sensory function. So sensory function is uh, acha, ha. Cranial nerve seven has five terminal branches. Na? What are the five terminal branches? Cervical, maxillary, mandibular, ophthalmic. No, no. What are the five branches? Sorry, guys, I forgot. Five branches of the facial nerve. Yeah, uh, I just remember the picture of the natter that you just okay. put your hand over the face. I have five so fingers. The yeah, the five fingers. So the upper one, I think that is the temporal. Temporal. Um, okay. Then then there is the um, uh, ophthalmic, I think. Maxillary, yes. And maxillary. then the mag maxillary. And uh, then is the mandibular. And then I think buccal, the last one is the buccal, cervical. Buccal and cervical. Buccal, 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 buccal. Yeah, buccal, yeah. So these five terminal branches, these are the five branches, motor or sensory? I think motor. Yeah, yeah, motor, motor, I think. Motor, 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 motor. motor. Five branches are motor. So they supply the temporalis muscle. They supply the ophthalmic muscle and levator palpebris superior is also supplied by the facial nerve. Uh, and then they supply the maxillary muscle, mandibular muscles and cervical muscles. Okay, so this is the action of five terminal branches of the facial nerve. So this is the, that's why we are doing the, you know, frontal muscle is which one? Temporalis and frontalis muscle. Okay, this is the frowning, frowning and winching of the face. This action is seen by the temporalis branch. And then the uh, closing the eye against the resistance. I will try to open your eye. You will not let me do this. Okay, this is the function of the ophthalmic division of the facial nerve. Then the maxillary, man, buccal and cervical. These are like, you know, puffing and then whistling. Okay, these things. So these are the test, facial nerve test for the motor. And sensory facial nerve test is the anterior two third of the tongue, taste sensation. And posterior one third of the tongue is by the glossopharyngeal. And most posterior part at, at the region of the uvula is by the vagus nerve. Vagus, okay, so, vagus. Yeah, so there are three taste sensation nerve. And this taste sensation nerve is called special sense. They are not normal sense. Like vision, hearing, taste, they are special sense, okay? So, uh, facial nerve has sensory and two thirds of the tongue. Motor is five terminal branch. And um, what is the uh, nerve to the stapedius? That that sense that nerve is called what? Nerve to the stapedius. We see the um, which test? Any idea? Nerve to the stapedius test. That is also a branch of the facial nerve. No? Nerve to the stapedius. There will be hyperacusis. Hyperacusis. Yes. 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 So that test is a part of facial nerve. Remember, that is not a part of the vestibulocochlear test. 
Protest to the hyperacusis. This is for the nerve of the stapedius. If there is injury in the internal facial canal, that is around the you know internal ear, the nerve to the stapedius goes to the now to the stapedius is facial nerve. Facial nerve. Yeah, there will be hyperacusis. Okay. Hyperacusis. Yeah, like you will do now. You will do whispering in the. Uh, this is for theory. In the exam, we will not do this thing. Okay. So if you whisper in the right ear, in the left ear. The child will feel very loud noise and pain if they have hyperacusis. This is the test of the facial nerve, okay? Or you can do like your finger test like this or any, any you know, paper. You will just uh, rub the paper inside, in, in front of the ear of the child. Okay, so this is the facial nerve, complete facial nerve. Now, um, this facial nerve course sometime asked in the exam. I heard one examinee, he, she passed, she said that, she was asked the facial nerve course in the exam hall. Okay, so theory, sometimes they ask in the exam, remember, anything can be asked. Like our in FCPS exam, we were prepared for anatomy, physiology, anything. Okay, so uh, this is the test of the facial nerve. Then the uh, glossop, now the eight. Eight nerve, how we will test? Eight nerve is purely sensory. So eight nerve has, uh, eight nerve has how many component? Two component, vestibular and cochlear component. Vestibular okay. And so vestibule is for the balance. Cochlea is for the hearing. Am hearing. I right? No. Okay. Yeah, so, cochlea for hearing. Yeah. So vestibule is for the balance. Balance test, how we will do? Same. Just Romberg test. This is the balance test. Because we know the Romberg sign has three component. One is the eye. Another is the vestibule. Another is the dorsal column. So if you close the eye and if your vestibular nerve is damaged, then you will fall down because you need two system intact. So if you close the eye, that means eye is gone. If, you, if your vestibule is damaged, that means vestibule is gone. So only one system is intact, that is the dorsal column. So when two system is damaged or two system is, I mean, you withdraw, then the child will fall. This is the Romberg test. For Romberg test, we need three components. Remember this thing. So if you close the eye, either there is dorsal column yeah, damage. Three components okay. of Romberg. Romberg test has three components. One mm. is tubular component. Another is dorsal mm -hmm. column, the posterior column, dorsal column of the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Another is eye. You need vision that you are in the air, you are upright position, you are in the air. So when the child is standing up, the child is seeing that he is in the air, he is not falling down. But when he closes the eye, if there is any injury in the dorsal column, like, uh, you know, the Charcot Marie tooth, Mm -hmm. or or if the vestibular nerve is damaged suppose there is head injury brain injury or infection of the vestibular nerve then the child will fall down okay, okay. if you okay. so this two system any two system should be good should be intact then okay. you can close the eye like me you we are we are okay our three system is okay so when i am standing and i am closing my eye i am not falling because my all the systems are okay yeah, but if balance. i yeah, if I have injury on the posterior column or vestibular column, vestibular nerve, then I will fall down. Okay, okay. what is the problem in cerebellar, cerebellar injury? In cerebellum, the child is ataxic, so he cannot even stand with the close with the opening oh, eye. Close, he will definitely on, fall down on the eye closed, right? Oh, so this is oh. rhombar test. Rhombar test is only for three system, eye. Vestibular column, vestibular, vestibular nerve, and dorsal nerve. But Romba test is not an ideal test for the cerebellar injury. Why? Because cerebellar injury has ataxia. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. So now this, uh, this is the cranial nerve eight. We are doing the vestibular part. Now the cochlear part. How we will do cochlear part? Cochlear part we do by the Rini and Weber test. Ideally, cochlear nerve should be done by the cochlear nerve test. That is called pure tonodiometry like this, okay? But for the exam, we don't have cochlear test, so we will do Rini and Weber. By this Rini and Weber, we can know the sensory, neural deafness, and conductive deafness. Now, this is, uh, I cannot remember exactly, but I remember that Rini and Weber, okay? Which one is in the midline? Weber. Weber is in the midline. You will put the hammer. You will Weber midline. The, Midline, you will put the what that is called tuning fork in the tuning fork, tuning fork, midline or in the frontal bone. Then 
you will close the eye and you will say the child that which area which ear you you hear the bell more you listen most. the bell which you hear the most most if mm. you if the child has sensory neural deafness in the right side he will not listen on the right side he will he will listen on the left side because if there is sensory neural deafness okay mm. so the bony conduction in the sensory neural deafness the problem is bony conduction is lost so the that area the child will not hear now this is the this is the weber test so weber what is rini test you will put the oh, i i think i am confused in the mustard in the mustard Mu bone mustard bone no first the rini you will bell the bell the tuning fork and you will say the child that you will put it in the i mean in, in front of the ear in front of ear yes Nor and then normally the Normally, yes. the AC AC is more than BC. Yes, it like is the right. air conduction is more than the bone conduction. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, this is Rene. So, if uh, it's reverse, so the Rene is positive. Yes. So Rene right. has Rene has two component. Remember, Rene has two component, AC and BC. But Weber only BC bone conduction. Weber does not has two component. So as I said, Weber he will put the You will put the tuning fork in the midline. This is Weber, but Rini first you will put the. Let me draw here in this. Let me let. Me. First you will put the ear, then you will put on bone. Yes, yes. First yeah, you the ear, the, then you put the on the bone. Yeah. Yeah. First you will. But you will put, put in mustard, mustard uh, bone. Mustard bone. Mustard. So here you will put the bell, a bell, tuning fork, and the child will say, he cannot hear. That means AC is lost. He cannot hear, and then. when you put the mustard bone here the child will say yes i can now hear that means that area is conductive deafness because ac is less than the bc normally ac is more than the bc here in the why this happening in conductive deafness if there is a you no know, otitis media rupture of the tympanic membrane then why there is ac is less than bc because the tympanic membrane is ruptured so the child's tympanic membrane is not working or there is fluid inside the ear so the tympanic part is not working but the bony part is intact sensory neural is intact so the child can hear when you touch the bone but the child cannot hear when you touch the ear you will put the ear because there is rupture of the membrane so that there is a lot of noise the child cannot identify the actual uh, bell okay so this is our uh, criteria for uh rini and weber so weber you will do only bony part and you will check which side is the sensory neural deafness and rini you will do two thing ac you will see ac and you will see bc this is the easiest way to remember uh, eighth nerve injury just one minute who is there hello Okay, sorry. So this is clear, everyone. This eight nerve. So in, hello, yes, hello, yes, yes yeah. Doctor Tharun. May I say something here? Of course, of course. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, in the Rini test, it is it's basically the comparison of air conduction and bone conduction. Normally, in our middle ear, because of its uh, function of the tympanic size, size difference and the lever action, there is magnification of the sound when they pass through the middle ear. and in case hmm. of conductive deafness as the middle ear structure is hampered here that's why air conduction is become less than even bone conduction normally we have more air conduction than bone conduction because of this middle ear function which magnify the sound hmm. okay yes. so that magni that magnification is not there in case of middle ear injury or any conductive deafness that's why uh, uh, the rini become negative in case of conductive deafness very good very good yes, yes. Yeah. And so uh, first we yeah, and uh, yeah so first we uh, put the uh, twinning for in front of the ear so when it ceases even uh, then we put on the bone yeah uh, uh, even after that we can hear that means the bone conduction become more because the magnification is which is normally functioning is not in case of conductive deafness okay, okay. and in case of, in case of uh, sensorineural deafness the rini will be false positive like normal 
Okay. And that's why we have to do the two tests, both are complementary to each other. Then in that case, we have to do the Weber test. And in case of Weber test, basically we are putting the twinning fork, we are only comparing the bone conduction on two sides. If our nervous system is intact, means cochlear uh, nerve is intact, then we'll hear equal on the both sides okay. by our normal uh, bony conduction. But what happens in normally, we have surrounding noise, which has a masking effect. Mm, but the, yes. in case of conductive deafness, suppose I have conductive deafness in a right ear, that masking effect of the right ear is not there. That's mm. why in a way, but will be hard more. It is lateralized to the diseased ear in case of conductive yes. deafness. Yes. Okay. And in yes. case of sensory neural, it will be less in the affected ear. Yes. So that's so how we have to interpret. We have yes. to interpret so, both. Hmm. Yes. Let me just two lines say, Weber test when you put the uh, tuning fork here it will go if it, there is a conductive deafness in this ear suppose it will more lateralize here why mm. because there is rupture of the tympanic membrane so there is no external noise is entering into the ear so the child will hear more in this ear okay but yes. suppose here in this area this area is sensory neural deafness also the child will hear in that area in this side so that means conductive ear conductive type of deafness the child will hear more and sensory neural deafness the child will hear more on this suppose this is the right ear so now how you differentiate this is conductive deafness or sensory neural deafness of this ear then you have to do this rini test if it is a conductive deafness then the ac will be less than the bc you got my point anyone not clear can share us uh, Dr. Manna, I don't know. Um, I have uh, made the things very simple for me. I could not understand all this. For me, the Weber is, we know how to perform Weber. So no need to go into the detail of that. If it is lateralized towards the affected ear, it's the conductive Yes, yes, right. Means we have yes. to know which ear is problem with here. Sound is broken, right? My sound is it okay. lies towards the normal layer. It's the very simple. If the Weber is lateralized towards the affected ear, it's a conductive deafness in, yes. in that ear. Hmm. If hmm. if the Weber is lateralized towards the normal ear, it's the sensing neural deafness yes Opposite right, right. Yeah. you're right yeah. you're right you don't right. know you don't know which year is the trouble that's why you have to interpret with the rini test yes you are right absolutely right yeah 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 first 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 of all you have to do the rene the second step is the weber so okay. um, in rene if the ac is more than bc i, I mean if it's a normal year it's a positive rene and the other is the negative if it is the reverse one Yes, yes, you are right. So, anybody is confused? Yes, that means po po positive Rini has two interpretations. It could be normal or it could be sensory neural deafness. Only the negative Rini is definitely conductive deafness. What do you mean by positive yeah. and negative? Positive, Maniki? What do positive you mean is air, air, air conduction more normal. than bone conduction. It is, it, AC, it is AC, normal. AC. Huh. But, but it may be positive in case of sensory neural. In case of sensory neural, it will be same. AC more than BC. That is called false positive Rini. Ah, okay. So AC more than BC means positive Rini. Positive Rini. Either positive Rini or false positive Rini. False positive, right? False positive. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, fine. Because so, here, here you cannot compare the, I mean, like audiometry, you cannot compare the amplitude or the intensity of the sound. Here, we are basically comparing the duration of sound. That's why yeah. it may be false positive. Okay, the child cannot say whether it is decreased or it is normal. Okay. So, until uh, up to this much knowledge is enough for the clinical exam. Okay, that yeah, you have to understand yeah. that waiver, waiver will be lateralized if there is conductive deafness or sensory deafness in the opposite side. This is the Weber test. And Rini, normal Rini, in normal air, AC is more than BC. Okay. But if there is a conductive deafness, there will be BC more than the AC. Okay. This much is enough for our clinical knowledge. This is the eighth test. So a cranial nerve eight, if comes in the exam, we know there is two tests, vestibular and cochlear. We did the cochlear by Rini and Weber, and we did the vestibule by the balance test, Romberg sign. And now cranial nerve 9, 10, 11, 12. 
very easy. Nine is nine ten is purely eleven twelve is purely motor. Nine ten are mixed. Glossopharyngeal vagus are mixed. Eleven twelve are purely motor. So in few words, how can we tell this thing? Nine ten eleven twelve. Nine is for the sternocleidomastoid. Ten uh, glossopharyngeal vagus. Ten how we do vagus? This is the um, uh, posterior most part sensory function. And vagus motor. Which one is the vagus motor? Anyone remember the vagus motor? Yes, vocal cord itself is supplied by vagus. Yes. Do we do the gag reflex? Gag reflex? No, no. We just tell the examiner that I want to do the gag reflex and movement of the uvula. Like if it is deviated on one side, that means there is a problem. Okay, movement of the uvula. This is the gag reflex. Yeah. And start like to the opposite side. Opposite side if it is upper motor neuron. And lower motor if deviate to okay. the same side. Vagus uh, for motor, uh, the swallowing for, and phonation. Uh, swallowing and phonation. Swallowing and phonation is for motor. Mm. Okay. Mm. Okay. How yeah, Dr. Tamanna. Mm. There, there is a simple formula <laughs> I made for that. Yeah, yeah. Tell us, please. Uh, I'm audible? Yeah, yeah. You're audible. Yes, Dr. Tahir. I think your network is not good today. Hello? Am I audible? Yes, yes you are yes. audible. Okay, okay. I, I think, think he's good. Uh, hi. Yes, we remember. No? Yeah, 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 yeah. We remember. Jovan saath mein hi deta hai, uvula deta hai. Exactly. Uvula saath mein deta hai, Jovan deta hai. Jovan saath mein deta hai. Nee. Jovan saath deta hai, uvula deta hai. Saath mein deta hai. Yes. Who made this? Dr. Tahir. This is Dr. Tahir. This is Dr. Tahir. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, Dr. Tahir, explain. What does that mean? Jawan <laughs> Sat. No, no, no. Let, let, me, let me enjoy what people what the people are saying. After that, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, you are expecting that. No, no, it's, a, it's a very good one. Very innovative. Very innovative. Uh, <laughs> That's why I could yeah. remember that you will eyes towards the opposite side from your saying. Yes. And tongue in the same side. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. Tongue, uh, it's like Zuban saath deti hai, yula saath nahi deta. It means the the if uh, uh, that the tongue will be deviated towards the side of lesion, and the yula will be deviated to the opposite side of lesion. Okay. Zuban saath deti hai. Upper motor and lower motor both. The tongue yes. will be tongue will be on the same Word, side. Yeah, towards the side of lesion. In and the uvula will be opposite to that. Yes, and uvula for the tenth. Uvula for the ten and uh, hypoglossus for the tongue. So yes, if tongue. there is if there is tongue hypo hypoglossal injury, okay, it will be deviation of the tongue on the same side. But if there is vagus nerve injury, then the uvula will deviate to the opposite side. Right? Yes, yes. absolutely okay. correct. Okay, so this is the yeah, 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 9, 10, 12. And what is 10 sensory? Vagus sensory is which one? Test sensation. Test sensation of the posterior most part of the tongue. This is the vagus. And uh, vagus has also sympathetic part, like, you know, re respiratory and cardiovascular, but we will not go that, that area, right? In the vagus, there is sympathetic part of the vagus nerve. Okay, so... 12, 12 is tongue. 11 is? 11 is which one? Accessory, accessory. Externo, externo, external mustard. So how you will test this one? Sternocleido mustard. Opposite of the neck toward the opposite side. I'll push down. I'll give pressure and I'll tell the child to push the neck on the opposite side, right? This is the accessory. Yeah. Okay. And which, which one was the glossopharyngeal? Sorry, I forgot again. Glossopharyngeal test. How you will do glossopharyngeal? Uh, we can ask the mother that whether the child have any difficulty in swallowing. Okay, glossopharyngeal is for swallowing. Okay, and I will, uh, shall I offer the child to drink something and I'll see the regurgitation or something? No need, Sorry. this thing no need. 
anyone have any idea about the glossopharyngeal only asking the mother that because glossopharyngeal and vagus are the mixed nerve so glossopharyngeal has sensory and motor so sensory is the sensation from the throat uh, sensation right? sensory test sensation from posterior one third of the tongue mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah. motor component uh, will help in swallowing so if the so, child is having any difficulty in swallowing we can ask the mother, mother or we mm -hmm. can test uh, the pharyngeal reflex pharyngeal reflex pharyngeal so, so uh, basically the palate palate palatal muscle palatal muscle in the pharynx is supplied by the glossopharyngeal and the laryngeal muscle is supplied by the 10th nerve vagus nerve that's why oh. very diffi uh, very difficult yeah. to uh, differentiate them okay okay so pharyngeal is by the glossopharyngeal and laryngeal is by the vagus nerve muscle. vagus nerve yes yeah, so the swallowing ah. actually needed both and Vegas, both the nerves should be intact for swallowing movement. Yes. That's why we do them together usually by do okay. the swallowing and all this. And, and so sensation people... from the sensation from the posterior one third of the tongue and the pharynx and upper part of the larynx, all these are by the ninth and tenth. Very okay. difficult to differentiate. Huh? Differentiate. Okay. And if okay. the child is having only tenth palsy, then in that condition he is having uh, difficulty in phonation, like his voice yes, is vocal cord palsy. Mm -hmm. Yes, vocal cord palsy. I, I think the only uh, test which we can do is the uh, you offer them water mm. and the second one is uh, the gag reflex but you never do both of them because of them. Are, you, offer. Some, you just offer them offer. and uh, yeah that's it and yeah. in uh, 11th in 11th yeah you check the sternomastoid but you have to check the trapezius for that you check the shrugging shrugging also oh, trapezius yeah. I forgot shrugging also yeah, yeah. Not only neck, but shrugging also. See, these things, how many times I read, I don't know. But also, I forget one-on-one -on -one component like this. So, we have to practice more. Practice has no bikalpo, you know, no alternative. I gave OET exam and uh, I felt why I did not practice more. I should practice listening more, reading more. So, these things, like, you know, this practice, I felt today. Today, I was doing a 30-minute meeting with Rihanna, communication in the morning. Uh, we had only 30 minute time so we did two scenario and Brihana and me both we felt that oh my god there is no alternative of practice if you practice daily 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 it will be your habit an exam will be very easy this thing I rem I feel now like now I am feeling see the cranial nerves are how much easy but after this you know two three days you will forget again okay this is the actually rule of uh, MRCPCH or any exam <laughs> Okay. In in Arabic, there is a quote. There is a quote in Arabic. Once you discuss, it, it stays inside you. You, yeah, yeah. And you train your brain. Whatever you discuss, that is the train, training of your brain. Yeah. And I was in the OET exam hall and I was only thinking one, ta one thing, you know, that why I did not practice more. I could practice listening. I could practice reading more, more. Why I did not do? Because I have some uh, family issue. I did not, actually, my mom was very sick. I did not uh, concentrate on the exam. But I give. I know I don't know what will be the result, inshallah. Okay, now, this is fatigability test. Fatigability test mm -hmm. is upward gaze for 30 seconds. Worse than tosses. Okay. Fatigability test, this is for myasthenia gravis. Right, myasthenia gravis. So you will tell the child to look at my finger above the head, and he will be fatigued after 30 seconds. He will drop the eyelid. This is the test for myasthenia gravis. Very important test. Peripheral muscles fatigability test. And other findings. Pointer. But Dr. Tamanna, uh, in uh, myasthenia gravis, yeah, it's supposed to be both side in the, no? not no. in one side. No, no, no. no myasthenia gravis can be unilateral also. Can be unilateral also. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Myasthenia gravis, usually it is bilateral, usually, because it is a uh, acetylcholine receptor blocking, but Horner can be unilateral. Yes, yes. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, you know, you have to better you, you do this test better and tell the examiner, mm -hmm. very unlikely this mm -hmm. is myasthenia gravis. Mm -hmm. okay, unlikely, because it can happen that one eye muscle is fatigued, another eye muscle still not fatigued. It can happen. It is not impossible, right? So better we do this test and tell the examiner that I'm finding one eye tosis, so right eye. So unlikely this is a myasthenia. Even then I want to do the test, fatigability test. 
and in the in the facial nerve in, in the oculomotor nerve injury there will be no change of the fatigue fatigue muscle other finding is goiter diffuse non tender hyperthyroid state with tremor why this is goiter you have to see the lead lag but same lead lag lead retraction for the uh, both the eye this is the goiter not only one eye okay and also you have to state the tachycardia bounding pulse and brisk reflex no obvious proptosis so this is not actually hyperthyroid another one i wanted to ask dr tahir you have any idea about the reverse ptosis what do you mean by reverse ptosis we did uh, in our another uh, session reverse ptosis what was that i don't remember that acha what is the difference between lead retraction and lead uh, lag this is you remember i think lead retraction and lead lag anyone idea lead retraction and lead lag uh, lead retraction uh, means uh, yeah. lead will be behind when uh, looking forward but lead lag means uh, when yes. the eye is moving eye lead will not be follow the eyeball during movement downward movements downward or lead upward retraction. Yeah, and upper also the lead uh, there will be lag lagging behind of the lead uh, eye lead to the eyeball movements in case of lead lag anyone say the a, a little bit easy word i know this thing Re but yeah retraction i think seen in hyperthyroidism both right? both in thyroid lead retraction lead lag both in hyperthyroid mm -hmm. the retraction means when looking forward the eye upper eyelid will be behind or you can see the upper end of the cornea and in lead lag when the eye will move that will be lagging behind that the white area will be then visible okay let me let me tell you lead lag mane already exposed the the upper eye upper sclera white part of the eye upper sclera is already exposed when you are looking at the child this is called lead retraction already it is exposed but when this is not exposed shuttle you are moving the finger above down and up only then you can see the upper sclera okay this is the lead lag i mean the lead upper sclera or lower sclera you can see the lower sclera because the eyeball is moving but the eye lid is not moving this is the lid lag but lid retraction means it is already retracted contracted so you can see when the child is looking at you you can see the sclera upper sclera this is called lid retraction okay so this is two different but both are seen in hyperthyroidism okay can you add me if i am wrong no yes yes that's i want to say yes the same thing okay. so in case of um not only will upper lid drops but the lower just one minute i'm seeing the reverse ptosis in many cases not only will upper lid drop but the lower eyelid will be affected sight will appear higher so what do you mean by reverse ptosis okay not only the upper eyelid will drop sometimes the lower eyelid goes upward above position this is called reverse ptosis so the lower eyelid problem in the lower eyelid okay because of paresis of the inferior tarsal muscle because of the paralysis of the inferior tarsal muscle and it is seen in which condition just one minute reverse ptosis is seen in brain injury or seen in uh, reverse ptosis is seen in pseudotosis reverse ptosis another name is pseudotosis okay we have to see from the google okay reverse ptosis but remember it is the paralysis of the lower tarsal muscle so the lower eyelid will go upward position this is the reverse ptosis okay so if you are given the cranial nerve examination of the face and there is ptosis how many things you have to examine first is wiper then 4ds then inspection of the face then vision check h shape movement to check the cranial nerves and light reflex okay so remember your finger remember your light reflex and other nerve like 5 7 8 9 10 11 12 12 fatigability test and goiter test goiter test is for bounding pulse tachycardia tremor the i mean the test for the hyperthyroidism if you feel there is a 
lead lag and lead retraction. The summary, suppose this is a 12 year old girl. So Jenny is a 12 year old girl with an isolated right sided ptosis with no other facial asymmetry or ophthalmoplegia. Ophthalmoplegia means what? There is no nerve, intraocular nerve injury. Okay, and normal pupil size. So this is not optic nerve injury. An intact pupil are reflex. So optic and oculomotor are intact. A fatigability test worse than heart ptosis. So this was a case of, she has an associated goiter. And I would like to complete my examination with a full examination for thyroid disease. My diagnosis is myasthenia gravis associated with a goiter, possibly due to concomitant grave disease. See, this is a very, very important case. And this kind of complete complicated scenario will be in the exam. Okay. See, Graves disease is autoimmune disease. Myasthenia gravis is autoimmune disease. So Graves disease can be presented with myasthenia gravis. It's very common, not uncommon. And so as we discussed this myasthenia should be bilateral. No, not always. Maybe the fatigability, fatigue eye is in the right side more than the left side. Fatigue, it is I right eye is more fatigue. It happens. So it was associated with goiter. And see, this, this is how interesting that our command was cranial nerve, but there was a goiter. You, you, when you observe, you did not do the goiter test. There are a lot of goiter tests. We know inspection of the goiter, palpation of the goiter. There is brewery, auscultation of the goiter. Inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, then swallow test to see the movement of the goiter. Then from side, from behind, you have to look the proptosis. There's many tests for goiter but we did not do any goiter test. Why? Because the command was not to check the goiter. The command was to check the cranial nerve. In this scenario, if you do not do the five, seven, eight, nine, high chance of fail, if you do test for goiter, because you find goiter is okay. You will tell that I found goiter incidental finding. Now I want to do full examination of the goiter. The examiner may be asked, what uh, full examination you want to do. Then I'll say, I will do inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation. I'll do swallowing test. I will check the reflex. I'll check the pulse for brisk reflex, pulse for bounding pulse. I'll check for TSHT4 to see the high thyroid status of the child. Okay, I'll ask the history. What history? Th constipation or diarrhea. Then tall stature. Then there will be uh, warm, hot intolerance. I'll ask the history. So history clinical exam, this is the thyroid related question. Then the examiner may go to the thyroid related question, but remember this child was myasthenia gravis and the fatigability test. So we will do in every tosis child fatigability test. Okay, so this was a very interesting case. So the my diagnosis was unilateral tosis, unilateral tosis due to myasthenia gravis associated with a goiter, possibly due to concomitant Graves disease. Now the differential diagnosis of unilateral ptosis, acquired and congenital. Acquired is myasthenia, Horner, cranial nerve three injury and myopathy, four. In one breath, we have to say the four, four cause, myasthenia gravis, Horner syndrome, cranial nerve three and myopathy. Myasthenia gravis we know can be unilateral, 50% only ocular, 50% only ocular. There is no peripheral muscle hypotonia. But 50% cases, myasthenia gravis can be presented with muscle hypotonia. And there'll be positive fatigability test. Fatigability test both in the eye and in the shoulder muscle, any muscle. You will raise the shoulder and sudden and soon the child will drop the shoulder. This is the peripheral muscle test for fatigability test. And Horner syndrome, sympathetic nerve injury. Okay, there may be a tumor, trauma in the sympathetic chain. Then there'll be Horner syndrome on the one side, ipsilateral side. So ipsilateral tosis, meiosis, and hydrosis. Okay, cranial nerve three, we know tosis. There'll be ophthalmoplegia, I mean squint. Pupil will be down and out. Diplopia, double vision. There'll be nystagmus. When you go outside the movement, nystagmus. And pupil will be midriatic, dilated. And fail to react on accommodation. So the accommodation reflex will be lost. Congenital cranial nerve injury in which nerve, cranial nerve injury, uh, chromosomal abnormality, like CP, acquired, maybe tumor infection, head injury. Okay, so CP child, we should not forget, can have cranial nerve palsy and tumor infection, head injury. Myopathy, what are the causes of myopathy? 
Myopathy will be ptosis of thalmoplegia, I mean paralysis of the muscles, without diplopia. Aiva. Okay. That is called mitochondrial myopathy. Okay. Ptosis and ophthalmoplegia without prominent pharyngeal involvement. Myotonic dystrophy can cause ptosis. And ptosis and facial weakness without ophthalmoplegia. Myotonic dystrophy, there will be sad face. Myotonic face is sad looking, drooping of the eyelid corner, drooping of the mouth corner, looks like sad. And there'll be no ophthalmoplegia. I mean, muscles, intraocular muscles are intact, but there'll be tosis. okay? Congenital tosis, like unilateral, non-progressive, there will be problem with amblyopia and strabismus. Congenital orbital fibrosis. This is autosomal dominant condition, fibrosis of the extraocular muscle. So they will limit eye movement and has associated tosis. So fibrosis and congenital tosis. These are the congenital cause. All are the acquired cause, myasthenia, hornar, then cranial nerve 3, oculomotor, and myopathy. Okay, any question from this? So how we will diagnose this child? This is next question. Diagnose, this is a myasthenia gravis child. So we will do 10 cylon test. Ice pack, what is that ice pack test? Transient improvement in tosis after application of ice pack. This I did not know. Anyone having any idea this ice pack test? I did not know this thing. I yeah, heard for the first time. We usually yeah. do the 10 sedan test. So they say transient improvement of the tosis of the application of ice pack. Okay. Now bedside tensilon, how you do? Tensilon is a drug. Okay. It is a adrophonium drug. Adrophonium. This is a anti-muscle relaxant, actually. Anti. So an anti-cholinesterase medication. And not there will be transient improvement of the tosis within 30 to 45 seconds, last up to five minutes. So this tensilon is a drug, small dose, IV drug. I will, will give to the IV cannula and this will act within 30 seconds. And this improvement of the tosis, I mean, the child will look up fully. There will be opening of the eye. This will last up to five minutes. This is the confirmatory test, tensilon test. Now, Serological test, we can do anticholinesterase receptor antibody. Present will be in the 50 to 90% patient with ocular myasthenia gravis. And electrodiagnosis like electrophysiological study, you can do repeated nerve stimulation test. There'll be decremental response. I mean, decreased response of the nerves until the muscle become refractory to the further stimulation. So if you do nerve conduction study around the muscle of the eye, then there'll be less reflex for certain time until it will be completely absent reflex because the nerves are tired, okay, in myasthenia gravis. So this is very important test. One is tensilin test, acetylcholine receptor antibody, and nerve conduction test, <coughs> okay? Now, other investigation, you can do CT scan to see thymoma. Why thymoma? Why thymoma? Because it can compress, no, no, no. What is the relation of thymoma with myasthenia? Is it immune disease? Yes, one of the treatment yes. of myasthenia gravis is to, uh, to remove, to remove the thymus. Uh, why that? Why that? Can you elaborate more? Why thymectomy causes myasthenia gravis? Um, they say that uh, there is uh, some antibodies which are shared by both of them. And because of that, uh, Mastenia yeah, happens. decreases the acetylcholine receptor antibodies. They will decrease the antibodies. I must. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Means here it is auto auto antibody production. So thyme, if removal of the thymus will decrease the auto antibody production. The idea is that. I did not get it. So we will do thymectomy to treatment of the gravis. Yes, the myasthenia in the myasthenia gravis, it is an auto antibody production against the acetylcholine receptors. Yeah, so, exactly. uh, yes. Yes. yes, and by removing the thymus, thymus is responsible for production of auto antibody. So, there will be less auto antibody production. Ah, so we will do thymectomy for the treatment. Yes, of it's a, yeah, it's an autoimmune disease. Yes, I got it now. So, thymectomy, we will do thymectomy for the treatment of chronic myasthenia gravis, it will decrease the uh, autoantibody production because we know the thymus is the school for the for the T cell. 
So if the thymus is removed, then the T cell will be removed. So the receptor antibody will be removed. So the patient will improve. Okay, in 5% cases. Okay. Then work for the other autoimmune disease, especially thyroid. Yes, in case of myasthenia, we have to remember celiac disease, diabetes, and uh, thyroid disease. These are very important to uh, rule out. Now the management is multidisciplinary, of course. There will be involvement of the neurologist, endocrinologist, and immunologist sometimes. So physiostigmine, pyridostigmine, these two drugs are the anticholinesterase drug. I mean, they causes muscle contraction. Physiostigmine, pyridostigmine, they are, they are actually cholinesterase. They inhibit the acetylcholine. Choline, oh, sorry, they increase the acetylcholine in the, in the presynaptic area by destroying the cholinesterase enzyme because cholinesterase break down the acetylcholine. So if you suppress this enzyme, cholinesterase, that is called anticholinesterase, then your acetylcholine will be stimulated the nerves. Okay, there'll be contraction of the muscles. Okay, and immunotherapeutic agent like prednisolone, cyclosporine, azathioprine, you can use carbimazole for the thyroid disease. Yeah, if it is a hyperthyroid. Then resolution of the ocular symptom only when euthyroid state is restored. So when you know the child will be euthyroid, you will see that the child's tosis, lit, lit traction, this is improved. Okay. Surgically thymectomy if thymoma is present. So there is if there is tumor, you will remove. But not in Graves disease due to potential worsening. Okay. So in myasthenia gravis, we have to remove the thymoma. But in Graves' disease, you cannot remove the thymus because it will worsen the disease. Very complicated things. Now background. Background, I mean the theoretical part. So muscle that surround the palpebral fissure, orbicularis oculi and levator palpebris superioris muscle. Orbicularis oculi is supplied by the facial nerve that causes the drooping of the eyelid, okay? And levator palpebris superioris help in raising, I mean opening of the eyelid. So it innervated by the oculomotor nerve. And the Muller's muscle is an accessory smooth muscle that serves to help elevate the upper eyelid innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic nervous system injury like Horner syndrome. Horner syndrome acts on which muscle? Muller's muscle. Okay, that's why there is tosis in Horner syndrome. Yeah, rather that that's called the um, partial tosis because that involves mainly the Muller muscle, not the levator palpebri superior. Yes, very good. Yes, that's why there is a partial tosis in Horner, not complete tosis, but yeah. in oculomotor nerve injury, there is a complete tosis. Yeah, we did the, this thing in Horner examination. And in orbicularis oculi, there is facial nerve injury, so it will be very wide open eye, and there is a chance of keratitis, dryness of the eye. Okay, fine. Now the neurologic uh, question, like, any disease that affect the neurological system, including the brain stem, cranial nerve, neuromuscular junction, muscle, peripheral nerve, can create tosis. Remember, anything, any injury in the brain pathway, muscle, nerve, neuromuscular junction can affect tosis. Third cranial nerve, oculomotor palsy will result in tosis. There will be ophthalmoplegia. I mean, eyeball will be down and out, diplopia, nystagmus. There will be lesion anywhere on the path between the oculomotor nucleus in the midbrain and the extraocular muscle within the orbit can cause third nerve palsy, okay? Horner syndrome is any dysfunction to the sympathetic nervous system that result in ipsilateral tosis, meiosis, not mitosis, it is meiosis and hydrosis. In children, Horner syndrome can lead to heterochromia iridis, a difference in the iridish color. Congenital Horner syndrome due to birth trauma can display tosis of the affected eye. Remember this heterochromia iridish, this is only done in congenital Horner. Why? Because the Irish muscle color, color of the Irish muscle is dependent on the sympathetic chain, sympathetic nerves. So if the sympathetic nerve is injured in the developmental stage, before the birth, then there'll be different Irish color. This is the heterochromia iridish. We also seen in Wardenburg, there is white forelock, heterochromia iridish. Wardenburg syndrome has some other features also. I forgot now. 
then Mastheny and Yeah, Wardenburg, it is actually white for lock with the... Um, uh, sensory uh, little hearing uh, loss. Uh, yeah, uh, but little sensory hearing loss and uh, ectopia uh, canthorum. What is that? Uh, basically, the canthus are not, uh, they are abnormal, the medial canthus and the lateral oh, canthus. Yeah. And they have association with the, uh, the, what is that condition, congenital, in which there is abdominal distension and obstruction. Acrocystitis? No, no, the congenital, the new need they present with that. Neck. And, not neck. Uh, we do biopsy for that. Hirschsprung's disease. Hirschsprung? Okay. Yeah, Hirschsprung. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, they have association with Hirschsprung. White forelock, then ectopia. White forelock. Yeah, I have seen one case actually. So white forelock, uh, ectopia canthorum, and uh, sensory neural hearing loss and association with the um, uh, Hirschsprung. Yeah. Yeah. And heterochromia iridis. Okay, this is the Wardenburg syndrome. Now, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder in which antibodies are directed against the postganglionic acetylcholine receptor in the neuromuscular junction of the voluntary muscles. Okay, so this is a problem in the neuromuscular junction. There is antibody that destroy the acetylcholine receptor. So the acetylcholine does not bind with the muscle and the muscle become floppy. Isolated ocular finding present initially, I mean, drooping of the eyelid and meiosis initially, and half of the case. Then unilateral or bilateral tosis can develop with or without diplopia, along with other ocular motor function, dysfunction. Infantile myasthenia gravis occur when antibody are transferred from the mother to the fetus via the placenta, because they are IgG type. Tosis can be the result of infectious botulism. Botulism is which type of disease? Botulism, botulinum toxin. Infection, which kind of infection this is? Which kind of infectious? What is this? Infection and botulism is not same. Botulism is a toxin. Why they said infectious? I have no idea. Botulism is a toxin we know. It is found in a canned food, like, you know, honey. If you give honey to the... Uh, no, it is a, it is a germ or Clostridium botulinum. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dr. Tamanna, your battery is down like me, like mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> <laughs> and what is this botulism for uh, honey? <coughs> what is that? Honey, Means that, that infection, yeah. that infection. Uh, actually... Yeah, actually, the spores, the spores yes, are there spores. in the honey, so that's why yeah. we, uh, we we don't give that yeah. because it causes lower lower motor yeah. neuron lesion, placid yeah. paralysis. Clostridium botulinum, Iva. Very good. Yeah, I forgot this clostridium thing. <laughs> yeah. Now the combination of tosis, of thalmoplegia without diplopia. So what is this? If there is ophthalmoplegia but no diplopia tosis and dysphagia should suggest diagnosis of oculopharyngeal dystrophy. I mean muscle dystrophy, okay? If there is dystrophy associated with this, dysphagia. Okay, that means myotonic dystrophy, myopathy. Especially if the onset is in the middle age, tosis and ophthalmoplegia without prominent pharyngeal involvement is a hallmark of many mitochondrial myopathy. Tosis and facial weakness without ophthalmoplegia is a common feature of myotonic dystrophy. This line is very important. That's why I highlight it. So tosis, facial weakness, but there is no intraocular muscle involvement. We have to remember there is no diplopia, double vision, no deviation of eyeball. Then it is, you have to think about myotonic dystrophy and facio-scapulohumeral dystrophy. Very important, two diseases, myotonic dystrophy and facio-scapulohumeral dystrophy. Aiva, finish. Anyone wants to practice this scenario? We did one and a half hour, only one scenario. Mashallah. Okay, let us discuss the next topic. We will practice again, inshallah. Okay, so now the gate. Okay. Dr. Tamanna, one thing regarding this scenario was uh, that what happens in third nerve palsy, let's suppose we have the same one and we talk about the different position. So in third nerve palsy, the I will be down and out. Down and out. 
Yes. Yeah, just to refresh these things. And in fourth, it will be up and in. Up and in. And Down and in. Reverse. Yes. And in six, there will be lateral gaze palsy. Six, there will be lateral gaze. I mean, if you ask the patient to see. Convergent squint, yes. Yeah, if you ask. Yeah. And uh, regarding the head tilt, in sixth nerve, it will be toward the affected side. The head will be tilted yes. toward the affected side in sixth. No, no. Head tilt is and only. Four... Head tilt is only for no, oblique. No. Muscle. Sorry. Head tilt is only for oblique muscle. That is uh, fourth nerve, trochlear, not for sixth nerve. Sixth nerve, there is no the, head tilt. There is, there is head tilt. There is head tilt in sixth also, but in sixth it will be towards the affected side, and in fourth it will be away from the affected side. Is, are you sure? Because I know that head tilting we do for tro trochlear nerve only. Because there is yes, a... because yeah, because in that case it is away from the affected side. Hmm. But in six there is towards the affected side. Why just just to compensate for that? Um, because there is downward gaze palsy in that case. So um, someone can recheck and we can discuss later okay. on. But this is how I remember. Nerve, actually, a... actually, I think in the uh, sixth nerve with the lateral lactose palsy, the function is a movement of the eye towards the lateral side. And as the yes. subject cannot uh, see the thing lateral to him, he moved yes. try to move the face. Actually, basically, yes. this is not oblique taking. This is the moving of the uh, uh, face to that side. Yeah, and towards the, of, they just uh, see uh, toward yeah. that ha. side. So it is a sort ha. of tilting. Yeah, but you can say they just see toward that lesion mm. side. Yes. I it's like not a, like the typical chin tilting. It's the moving of the face towards the side. And in yes, the court, it's a, yes. the typical uh, chin tilting. You are, you are yeah. not... We can say it is not a tilting. We can say, suppose, he will turn the face. The, the word should be turn yes, the face. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can say that. But the fourth is important. You need to remember that, that in fourth... Uh, we do away now. Now I just want to. Uh, someone can re uh, refresh that. That in which condition the patient cannot go downstairs? Yes, yes. It, it's which injury in which you ask them to go downstairs and they cannot. It's the uh, uh, fourth trochlear. Uh. <laughs> yeah, trochlear. Yeah, I think it's the yes, trochlear yes. one uh -huh. because there's a downward gaze palsy. Uh -huh. In trochlear, the eyeball is up and in. So the problem, he cannot see the down because the trochlear nerve supplies SO4, SO4, superior oblique. And the yes. lateral rectus is by the sixth nerve and SO4 is by the trochlear nerve. So if there is superior rectus palsy, the superior rectus function is to look down. The inferior rectus function is to look up. So if there is superior rectus palsy, the child cannot go downwards. The problem, he will fall down. If there is an oculomotor nerve palsy that is supplied the inferior oblique muscle, right? Inferior oblique is supplied by the oculomotor nerve. So the inferior oblique palsy or oculomotor palsy, the child problem is going upstairs. Okay, this is a very good point you memorized. Yeah. So the superior oblique palsy that is four, child cannot go down. Inferior oblique palsy that is three, the child cannot go up. Yes. And and I think I think this is called perinot syndrome, if if I'm not wrong. <laughs> you know? Perinot syndrome. Now this is different. Perinot syndrome. Who can tell us the perinot syndrome? Now because you know? because why I am saying this? It's not something like uh, to use fancy words, but because these two are very related. Because one is the downward gaze palsy and one is the upward gaze palsy. So one of them is the perinot. Now I'm not sure that this downward gaze palsy is supranuclear gaze palsy. Perinot syndrome is okay. supranuclear gaze palsy. Okay, that pulsi. is supra. Okay, that is supranuclear. Yeah. This is superior sup perinot syndrome, also known as dorsal midbrain syndrome. It is a supranuclear vertical gray gaze palsy. That means the child cannot see vertically. Super cannot see up, Yani. Yeah, vertical gaze yeah, palsy. That, that, that's why, because I, I just remember that one is you cannot see down and one is you cannot see up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a dorsal midbrain. It's both up and down for perinodes. You can't see up or down. Up, up. Supranuclear vertical no, gaze. I think it's both. It's both. You cannot see up and down. 
Okay, but yeah, because the third and fourth nerve, because the midbrain involves the third and fourth, so maybe yeah, both up and down, but uh, mostly maybe the up. But I'm not sure. Congenital dorsal midbrain syndrome. There is a, some, you know, blood supply hampered in the midbrain, dorsal midbrain, and the the vertical gaze. The child cannot look up and down. The child can look horizontally. I mean, side to side, but cannot look up and down. Yeah, we read it in our part one. Perinot syndrome, also known as dorsal midbrain syndrome, is a supranuclear vertical gaze problem. There is a compression of the superior tectal nucleus. Okay, so the clinical presentation is. Upward gaze palsy often manifest as diplopia. Pupillary light near dissociation. So pupil responds to the near stimuli but not light. So pupillary light reflex lost. Convergence retraction nystagma. So if you do the convergent movement of the eye, there will be nystagmus. So there is no problem in downward gaze. Okay, Nisha, there is upward gaze problem. Cannot look up. If there okay. is if there is upward look, then it is diplopia. And there is problem in, in stimulus, pupillary response to near stimuli, pupillary light near dissociation. People respond to near stimuli, but not light. So light reflex lost. Light reflex loss, superior palsy, superior vertical gauge lost, and convergent lost. These three are the called perinot syndrome. And it is a congenital condition, actually. OK, fine. So if this is a case of oculomotor nerve, as Dr. Tahi reminded, there'll be tosis, there'll be mydriasis. So when you do the light reflex, you'll see unequal pupil. Okay, oculomotor. And the oculomotor nerve injury, there'll be loss of direct and consensual. Not direct, consensual light reflex will be lost. Because direct is by the, yeah, direct also will be lost. Because the light, you, you give the torch light here, you give the torch light here. So here, it will go in the brain via the optic nerve and it will come back to the oculomotor nerve. So if this area oculomotor is injured, then the pupil will not constrict. Okay. But here in this eye, pupil will be constrict because that, suppose this is the right, uh, this is the right side, right side pupillary oculomotor is intact, but the left oculomotor is injured. So the direct light reflex will be lost. Okay. So that's why you will understand there is my dresses in the left side and loss of direct light reflex. So this is oculomotor nerve injury. So mydriasis, tosis, and the eyeball will be down and out. If you do the movement, H-shaped movement from here and here and here, you'll see there'll be nystagmus. Where, which side nystagmus? This area, I mean, the when the eyeball is going to, when your finger is going to medially and up, medially and up, there will be nystagmus because a child, a child can look only down and out. He cannot look medially, he cannot look up. There will be nystagmus. Nystagmus? Yeah, nystagmus, there will be nystagmus. Okay. Right. Yeah, because why nystagmus? Because the child will try to look, try to look at your finger and there will be jerking. Am I right or wrong? Uh, I, I don't know, I, I just heard this for the first time, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, even in six cranial nerve palsy, if the child try to look laterally, there will be nystagmus because yeah. cannot move. That's why. Yeah, the try will try. The child will try, no, to follow your finger, and that time he will have jerking of the movement, involuntary movement because of the para paralysis of the muscle. Okay, this is you see in all all the nerve, like you know three, four, and six, three, four, six, all the nerve you will see nystagmus if you do the movement to the opposite side. Okay, there will be nystagmus. I think this is the correct statement. Okay, now any any comments, anyone? So if it is an oculomotor nerve injury, what is the most important test? We will do CT scan or MRI to see the, to see the injury, hemorrhage, trauma, tumor, anything. Oculomotor nerve can be injured from birth. This is called congenital oculomotor nerve injury. And the, that, that is different. That is different issue. We will do nerve conduction study. And the management, management according to the cause. If it is due to muscle, if it is due to a tumor, we have to remove the tumor. If it is due to hemorrhage, we have to stop the bleeding and do the you know hemorrhage clot removal like this. OK? So this was our nerve related to the eye. 
now uh, we have few more minutes we can start this topic and we can practice after the next day so this child present with difficulty in walking see the command is very vague okay cannot specify it please examine the gate so how many types of gate you know and what should be your command this is very important first of all we have to say the wiper of course the position of the child and what is introduction permission and you have to see the gay uh, 4ds of course see the surrounding distress dysmorphism and then you will say the child to stand up first of all and look the balance if the child is falling down during stand up okay that times you have to be very careful the child is ataxic okay so overall the child is well thrived this child is well thrived mental status is well, you are starting to rapport because you have to see the scanning speech takachu takachu or scanning speech in cerebellar disease so what's your name your dress is very beautiful who gifted you okay which class are you in and uh, so this is uh, like stakachu speech is like scanning speech you will say like uh, uh, ma, uh, in a, in, like this you will talk like talk like you know scanning machine and dysarthria this is sizzling sausage uh, i mean the word if you find the child has difficulty in speaking then say you know hippopotamus or sizzling sausage like this words i mean difficult word then see to keep her balance the child with ataxic walk bend forward this is the typical position they will bend forward and they will you know wide their hands so that they do not fall their hands will be wide apart she takes irregular step like a sailor on a rough sea so remember the sailor on the you know ship and the sea is very rough so you see how he is uh, walking he is extending the hands and then then the his walks are very irregular haphazard or somewhat who is drunk so remember drunken gait or like sea sailor gait okay this is the ataxic gait and there is no pattern actually ataxic gait has no pattern irregular now gait examination how i will do gait examination if there is a broad based unsteady gait irregular exacerbated by tandem walk what is tandem walk suppose you will draw a line like this and you will tell the child that he, imagine there is a line and you walk with this line like this right foot left foot right heel, foot heel to toe heel to toe walk so yes your heel will touch the toe here your heel will touch the toe of the opposite limb like this heel to toe walk so heel to toe walk means that does not means heel walk and toe walk this is like your heel will touch the toe of the foot another foot so this is the tandem walk in a line in a line he cannot do a cerebellar palsy child cannot do this walk so tandem gait will be positive he will be he will showing that he cannot do this tandem gait okay sign tandem sign or tandem gait you can say stagger chatra not stagger mane when turning rapidly so when the you say the child that turn around go to the room turn around he will like fall down staggering and fall okay toward affected side going around the chair okay that means if the right sided cerebellum is injured then he will fall on the right side but cerebellum is not a big organ okay it is a small organ so usually cerebellitis occur in both the area so he can fall in any side but particularly if he fall down on the right side then you can say it is a right sided cerebellar injury romberg now we discussed about the romberg fall with eye open in cerebellar test the child will not elicit the romberg he will fall even when the eye is open so you cannot do this is called inconclusive romberg i mean you cannot do any conclusion by this romberg because the child's balance is lost during the standing position not the eye not to involve the eye there is truncal ataxia unable to sit on edge of the bed without limb supported unable to sit up from the lying with arm folded this test i saw in in mrcpch video okay this test i saw for gower sign and the you know the uh, i think i should open the video then okay so the position is like you know this hand will be here in the shoulder and this hand will be here in the shoulder 
and then the child will lie down and he will sit by touching the shoulder both shoulder he will sit he cannot do this thing if he has ataxia trunkal ataxia okay he cannot do this thing and this test is also important to see the gavar sign okay a, a gavar sign positive child cannot uh, hold the arm and sit because there is also trunkal ataxia trunkal weakness in duchenne muscular dystrophy so in both the conditions cerebellar condition and duchenne muscular dystrophy if the child holds the shoulder he cannot sit unable to sit from lying down with arms are folded around the shoulder this test i saw in mrcp video so it is a very important test and complete gavar sign you have to see by lying position if you do from sitting position this is incomplete gavar sign okay complete gavar is lying position from lying position now the eye what is the eye sign nystagmus no horizontalities no horizontal nystagmus no telangiectasia okay so in cerebellaritis what is the this is vertical right anyone can remind in cerebellaritis there is vertical nystagmus right yes because uh, what i remember there is a brain involvement so cerebellum is on the side and cerebrum is up so there is vertical nystagmus in that case and horizontal in cerebellum okay so horizontal in cerebellum they said uh, no horizontal cerebellum nystagmus i think this ataxia telangiectasia no no in uh, horizontal nystagmus in cerebellum you look for horizontal nystagmus because the uh, nystagmus is towards the side of lesion so this is always horizontal it's never vertical vertical uh, is when there is some pathology in the cerebrum up uh, in the brain so there is vertical yeah. nystagmus in that case nystagmus is the cp child vertical nystagmus when there is yes. pathology in the cerebrum uh, i i remember it like this because cerebellum is lying on the side of the brain so it is horizontal and cerebrum is up so there is vertical nystagmus in that case Okay. Okay. Yes. So, in this child, there was no cerebrum. They are saying in this child there were no horizontal nystagmus and no telangiectasia. So that was not a case of ataxia telangiectasia. Okay. Ataxia telangiectasia is same as cerebellitis because there is also involvement of the cerebellum, but due to due to autoimmune antibody, auto antibody. Oh, sorry, or not auto antibody due to genetic defect. It is a, a genetic defect. Yeah. now upper limb coordination so upper limb coordination what test you will do static tremor ah uh, which one is intention tremor and which one is static tremor intention tremor intention tremor is a sign of cerebellar dysfunction but why they are saying static tremor positive i think this child had static tremor okay they are they are differentiating na so intention tremor mane ki when you are um, suppose you are pointing one finger and you are saying that the child that please touch my finger tip and he will past point no no this is past pointing uh, what is intention tremor is seen in parkinsonism actually mainly no but in pediatric we are not talking of parkinson yeah, yeah that's right static tremor probably in cerebellar no intention tremor you know uh, intention tremor mane when you outstretch outstretch the hand and the child and the child will show tremor you will uh, it is static. static no 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 this is this is a static tremor intention tremor when you take a pencil the tremor will start just like in yeah. parkinson when you do yeah. nothing there will be nothing happening but if you are going to do some work like take a pen or take a pencil so there will be tremors Yes, yes, like in Parkinson. This is static tremor, or this is called resting tremor. Resting tremor is seen in, I think, cerebellum, right? Resting tremor. Doctor Tamanna, both can happen. Both can happen in cerebellum. Okay. Resting tremor, intention tremor, both can happen. Actually, tremor can happen, right? Okay. So drifting of arms and rebound. What is this drifting of arms? So if you 
Dr. Tamanna, this uh, static tremor occur due to hypotonia because the tone is low. Okay. And same, drifting arm, You, you wh who showed the picture in the group? Like there will be pronator sign, no? Drifting arm is called pronator sign. So you will pronate your arms and suddenly one arm will try to drop. Drop. This is the pronator sign or drifting arm sign. This is positive in case of cerebellar disease. And what is rebound? Rebound, I don't know. What is rebound? Dysmetria, we know. Dysmetria uh, is the... Rebound, rebound is like that... Uh... You you hold the arm of the patient, mm. and uh, you ask him to uh, to flex your arm, and then you suddenly release your hand. So he will hit his face because he cannot stop it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And these things we have to be very careful because the child may injure himself. Yeah, you 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 never do that. You never do that in exam. You just tell them that. Uh, but 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 you can do this when the child is lying sleeping mm. posture you, then you do that because i have seen videos in in uh, they do the rebound when the child is sleeping because in that case they cannot hit their face okay 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 so this is rebound and dysmetria mane past pointing no this is the past pointing if you the touch the child cannot touch the finger and cannot touch the nose there will be past pointing able to locate the nose with eye closed he cannot the child cannot and this kinesia, we all know, rapid uh, ups and down movement of the palm. So, lower, so how many examinations we did? First, we check the gait and what will be the gait. Then we check the arm, eye. Then we check the upper limb, then the lower limb. Lower limb, there is no muscle wasting, no hypotonia, brisk reflex, but downgoing plantar. Downgoing plantar indicate there is no upper motor neuron injury. Heel shin test, yeah, this is a coordination test. Unable to tap foot rapidly. This is also same, the hand, this dadogokinesia, same test. Toe, proprioception intact. I mean, the, yeah, the toe proprioception maniki, the position, joint position, up and down by closing the eye. Toe proprioception. This is we do for not cerebellum. This is we do for dorsal column, proprioception and vibration. This is, this we differentiate the dorsal column from the cerebellar test. And if it is a Frederick ataxia, then we have to do additional something like we have to see the pest covers, scoliosis. So you have to touch the floor, touch the floor of the, you have to ask the child to touch the floor and to see is there any obvious scoliosis, neuropathy. Heart, check the heart. Heart, heart is for Frederick ataxia. Yeah, Frederick's. Mm. Yeah, areflexia and but in Frederick's cardiomyopathy is there now. So how uh, what will we get by checking the heart? Yes, you're right. Uh, what we will find in cardiomyopathy, we will find the lateral displacement of the apex bit, and there'll be uh, you know what this called loud no. loud. In advanced cardiomyopathy, we uh, we would get uh, ER MR because yes. it is not working perfectly so in advance when the uh, ejection fraction is less than 30 in that case one day we can get ar mrt or etc also we can get otherwise uh, otherwise pulse is weak apex is displaced yeah. heart sound is distant can be distant can be distant yeah mm -hmm. ar mr yeah fine this is the cardiomyopathy finding so if it is a case of frederick we have to do see the pest cava scoliosis neuropathy means what Frederick ataxia is a combination of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. This is the most atypical uh, because the uh, jarts are lost, neuropathy, but the plantar is upgoing. This is the most uh, delicate point you have to remember. There's pescavus, scoliosis associated with loss of reflex and extensor plantar reflex. And also there will be neuropathy, features of neuropathy. I mean, rhombar will be positive in a Frederick ataxia. If it is a case of ataxia telangiectasia, you may find telangiectasia in every part of the body, like shoulder, in the eye, in the cheek, in the forehead, any part of the body you can find. And also it has, it is problem in autosomal recessive gene, ATM gene, and chromosome 11 problem, and short, thin child, oculocutaneous nystagmus, sorry, telangiectasia, three to seven year on bulbar conjunctiva, so it will present three to seven year mainly child 
in bulbar conjunctiva or in the ear, in the nose, in the neck. Okay, and then oculomotor apraxia. What does that mean? Oculomotor apraxia. Apraxia. I mean, the oculomotor nerve will be injured in ataraxial injection. So there will be a problem in the oculomotor nerve also. Nystagmus, yes. And you will find recurrent sinus infection, sinusitis, lung infection, that is any infection because the problem is with the T cell. So the T cell is suppressed in ataraxial injectasia. So there is a lot of problem in infection and bronchiectasis you will find. And that there one thing. Oculomotor apraxia. Sorry, Oculomotor apraxia is when there is uh, when we are not able to control the eye movement. So there is loss of voluntary eye movement. So mm -hmm. that is like when we ask them to move horizontally. Uh, so they won't be able to move their eyes horizontally. So that is oculomotor apraxia. I mean, I mean imbalance, imbalance of the movement. You are asking something and he is going somewhere like this. Apraxia. Yes, yes, like that. Yes. So ataxial injectation also has a low immunity. Number one, they have immunosuppression condition. Another condition is they have high chance of tumor like leukemia, lymphoma. So the problem is they are very weak thin child, you will find many cannula mark in ataxial injectasia, growth failure child, febrile child, anemic child, and there is cutaneous tail injectasia, conjunctival, and there'll be oculomotor nystagmus, sinus infection, lung infection, okay. So now this child, I would like to conduct my exam by performing a sensory examination. So whenever any child has problem with gait, you have to do, we have to tell that I want to complete my neurological examination by doing sensory and cranial nerve also, you have to say, assess the vital sign, why? Because there may be a sign of raised ICP, intracranial pressure, so bradycardia, hypertension, and evaluation of the result of a fundoscopic exam, looking for papilloidoma. This fundoscopic exam we forgot in the previous case, I Endoscopic exam should be, we should offer in every cranial nerve, in every gate, neurological exam, because this is a part of neurological exam. Am I right? Do you agree with that? Fundoscopy we should offer, no, at least? Absolutely. Yeah. Should offer, because in the cranial nerve palsy, third nerve, one of the causes is oculomotor, sorry, one of the causes is in intracranial tumor. So there will be papilloidema. Okay, so we should offer this fundoscopic exam in every neurological child and then looking for papilloidoma an autopic exam for middle ear yeah if there is a cranial nerve injury you have to say autoscopic i mean uh, to see the middle ear okay summary is a chloe is an eight year old girl with difficult walking due to cerebral ataxia so this child had cerebral ataxia likely to be acute onset now cerebral ataxia we have to remember two important cause, acute and chronic. Acute means post-infectious cerebellitis and chronic is due to CP, and that is atonic CP or tumor, it's chronic. So I would like to check with mother how long her symptom have been present. Is it acute and chronic? Very important point. My top of differential of this cerebellar ataxia are, if it is acute, then post-infectious cerebellitis, brainstem, uh, <clears throat> most common cause, it will be asked in the exam, which is the most common cause of post-infectious cerebellitis? It is varicella, chickenpox. Then enterovirus, are there any virus? Drug, yes, phenytoin, carbamazepine. Okay, these things, we know all this theory, but you know, during exam, when the examiner will ask, there'll be throat blockage, definitely, even me also. So we should practice this scenario 10 times, 11 times. So post-infectious is main cause is varicella and any virus, enterovirus, other virus. And drug induced is phenytoin, carbamazepine, anti-epileptic drug, sedative hypnotic drug, alcohol, and any solvent, gas. Hemorrhage and head trauma is also acute cause. It will be present with headache also. Increase ICP, that will be also headache, tumor, trauma, Infar, but tumor is actually chronic. 
okay but if acute is head injury hydrocephalus chronic infarction chronic thrombosis vasculitis kawasaki okay now chronic are tumor medulloblastoma this is you have to tell because this is the most common posterior fossa tumor is medulloblastoma infratentorial astrocytoma is the second most common then hemangioblastoma we see in, in von Wippel lindu disease and glioma frederick ataxia it is we already discussed autosomal recessive chromosome number nine and chromosome 11 is ataxia right ataxia telangiectasia is chromosome 11 and frederick is chromosome nine okay pescava scoliosis neuropathy areflexia and sensory planters now ataxia telangiectasia it is autosomal recessive atm gene on chromosome 11 there is short thin oculocutaneous telangiectasia okay three to seven years these things we read already i'm not going they are poor repair of dna damage so their problem is they have dna damage so avoid radiation this is the chromosomal this is called fragility no? hyper fragility okay the chromosomes are fragile in ataxia telangiectasia yeah so if you give radiation they will have attacks and decrease Ataxia telangiectasia has decreased IgA, GE, but high IgM. As unable to class switch. Okay, so IgM cannot convert into IgA. I mean, switching cannot be possible. Okay. Increase alpha fetoprotein, so they have chance of leukemia, cancer, liver tumor, okay, bronchiectasis. This is a chronic. So chronic is three, posterior fossa tumor, Frederick ataxia, and ataxia telangiectasia. Acute is also three. We remember like post-infectious, then drug-induced, then hemorrhage. Remember these three. And intermittent is metabolic. Sometimes that, that is which metabolic disease can cause cerebellitis, heart knock, maple syrup, urine, pyruvate, all uncommon, okay? And basilar migraine. So in case of migraine, the child will have ataxia. This is the cause, basilar migraine. And seizure disorder, intermittent cerebellitis or ataxia. Okay. So Guinberry syndrome, why this is important? Because in Guinberry also have ataxia, areflexia, but weakness, muscle was weak. And Miller-Fisher variety has ophthalmoplegia, I mean, the nerve, ocular nerve will be injured in Miller-Fisher variety. And neuroblastoma, there'll be, I mean, sympathetic chain tumor, neuroblastoma. So this is ataxia, there'll be myoclonic jerk and opsoclonus myoclonus. I mean, dancing eye and dancing body. This is called opsoclonus myoclonus, especially seen in neuroblastoma. And it is a paraneoplastic syndrome, okay? Okay. So what are the common causes of ataxia by the age group? So if our child is less than one year, we have to think about congenital malformation of the brain stem or cerebellum. And you have to think about hydrocephalus, CP. This is main important point. One to five year drug, phenytoin, carbamazepine. And then post-infectious cause in one to 10 years. See, the one to 10 year has post-infectious cause. And then my neuroblastoma is early childhood, one to five years. And then inborn error, brain tumor, ataxia telangiectasia start from one year. And five to 10 year, drug in every case, five to 10, one to five. Acute cerebellar in all age. And, uh, but we have to remember that GBS, the Guinberry syndrome below 10 year is very rare. See, the Guinberry, that is Miller-Fisher variety below 10 year is very rare. Hmm? And multiple sclerosis also below 10 year rare. Okay. Hereditary te uh, ataxia, telangiectasia, and hereditary ataxia, they are present in every age, more than one year, every age. Okay. So some varieties are common in early age, some varieties are in the after 10. This is the difference you have to remember. Now diagnosis, MRI with magnetic resonance angiogram. If you suspect there is space occupying lesion, hemorrhage, thrombosis, vasculitis, you will do MRI, MRA. Lumbar puncture only we do in GBS to see the, the albuminocytological dissociation, raised protein, 
infective cause, inflammatory cause, there'll be raised protein and CSF varicella, PCR, if you suspect it is varicella. Uh, other cause, you can do the phenytoin level and carbamazepine level, toxicology screen. If it is chronic, you have to do IgA level to see the attack shuttle injectasia. There'll be raised IgA, sorry, decrease IgA, no? decrease IgA and raised IgM. This is the attack shuttle injectasia. And uh, alpha fetoprotein to see attack shuttle injectasia, metabolic workup like heart nerve disease, maple syrup urine disease, and genetic workup for chromosome 9 and chromosome 11 to see the Frederick ataxia and ataxial injectation. Now the background information. Background information, Maniki? Achha. Different types. They are, they are differentiating the cerebellar with the sensory and with the labyrinth. I mean, this is the vestibular function. So location is cerebellar pathway. Here, sensory location is in the dorsal column, posterior column. And here it is in the vestibular part. Gait will be broad based, larching or staggering gait, or sweet running. Ah, this is important. You have to say the child that can you run for me? And also uh, tandem gait. And Romberg sign will be positive in eye open. I mean, the child will be fall down, will fall down with eye open. Broad based gait, but high stepping gait. Very, very important. High stepping gait we see in sensory ataxia. Okay, dorsal column injury. Why? Because there is foot drop. So the child will compensate the foot drop by stepping high. There is dorsal column injury. So foot drop. Foot drop, another nerve is posterior. Uh, what is that called? Peroneal, no? Common peroneal, sorry. Common, common peroneal. Common peroneal. Nerve. It is a branch of which nerve? Um, sciatic nerve, no? Sciatic nerve. It is a branch of sciatic plexus. Yeah. Okay, so common peroneal nerve injury, or, or you can say by higher high stepping gait we see in the dorsal column injury, and rhombar will be positive with eye closed. This is a true rhombar sign. Here also, broad gaze, larching gait. Here not high stepping gait, but rhombar is positive also here, because this labyrinth function, vestibular function is important. How you will do? Unable to stay balanced in the air, sitting and standing without limb support, for not possible. Intention tremor, possible. Dysmetria, that is past pointing and hypotonia. Here appears normal. The child appears normal in sensory ataxia when sitting position. But loss of position and vibration sense of extremity and with fine finger movement. Attack, uh, tremor, okay, fine tremor, fine tremor. In labyrinth, there is normal at normal, a normal exam during sitting. Better with eye closed. Maybe oars with head movement. So in labyrinthal ataxia, the child will fall down if you close the eye. I mean, rhombar will be positive, okay. Speech is slurred in here, cerebral ataxia. That is Takachu speed, but Sensory, when a Frederick ataxia, speech will be normal. Dorsal column injury, here also speech will be normal. Diagnosis, differential diagnosis, acute and chronic and intermittent. Here, differential diagnosis is dorsal column injury and also vitamin B12 deficiency. And here, benign paroxysmal vertigo, positional vertigo, BPPV. We read yesterday, BPPV, benign paroxysmal Positional vertigo. This is very benign without any cause. It can happen several times, few minutes to few hours, and the child will complain of vertigo when wake up from sleep. This is benign positional vertigo. And labyrinthitis, I mean infection of the middle layer. Middle, middle layer or internal layer? Internal layer, sorry, not middle layer. Labyrinth is in the internal layer. Okay. So this is the differential diagnosis of three kinds of ataxia. Now, cerebellar vermis, truncal ataxia while sitting, head titubation, tremor, okay, tremor, head tremor. Cerebellar hemisphere injury, gait fall toward the affected site. Dysmetria and ipsilateralis. This is actually very minute detail, okay. If it is vermis in injury, vermis is the middle part, okay, middle part of the cerebellum that connect the two sphere. There'll be trunk. 
uh, this is Dr. Tamanna, very important. Vermis is the middle part and it will involve the middle part of the body. And hemisphere as the lateral part and they will involve the lateral part of the body. Uh, so the limbs will be involved in hemisphere and the trunk will be involved in vermis lesion. Okay, I got it. Okay, very important point, yeah. Okay, and so the limbs will be affected towards the side. And peripheral sign, you will see the dysmetria, that is past pointing, ipsilateral extremity. You will see this sign in case of cerebral hemisphere injury. But in case of vermis injury, you will see the uh, truncal part. Yeah, very important point. Okay. Now the gait, gait, very, very important. Okay. See as much as possible in uh, YouTube. Okay. Daily try to see the YouTube videos for gait. How much you see, there is very difficult to memorize gait. So altered unstable balance, myopathy or neuropathy. Both in myopathy and neuropathy, there will be unstable balance weakness or decreased reflex. So myopathy also decreased reflex, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Okay. At the later stage, the, uh, the, the reflexes are decreased. And also the GBS reflexes are lost. Neuropathy, that is called Frederick ataxia, reflexes are lost. Okay. Sensory neuropathy, reflexes are lost. Now unsteady, narrow-based gait. Okay. Spasticity, increased tone. So this is upper motor neuron, unsteady gait, but narrow based, not broad based. So this is, there is spastic gait. Okay, hemiplegic is a spastic gait. Paraplegia is a spastic gait. Increased tone and brisk reflex. If there is a movement disorder, suppose chorea, myoclonic jerk, there is abnormal movement during rest. Chorea is a dancing movement, haphazard dancing movement of the large muscle. And myoclonus is a sudden shock-like movement, just like electric current. So abnormal movement during the rest. It can be chorea, it can be myoclonus. We have to differentiate by the seeing the movement. Then what history will ask in this child? What is the duration? Most common, most important history is which, what is the duration? Is it acute and chronic? How it started, suddenly or after RTI infection, then it is post-infectious. How it started? with after some drug that means it is drug induced recent infection of throat rti recent any seizure so it can be thrombosis it can be hemorrhage head injury systemic feature associated feature so we know the history taking station right there are three column present column past column and social column so in the systemic inquiry systemic inquiry is in the present column you have to ask associated symptom that is headache early morning vomiting altered mental status, photophobia for papilloidoma, vertigo, and birth history, torch. If the child is very small, we have to ask the torch infection. Family history is important, consanguinity, why? Because autosomal recessive disease, ataxial injectasia. Sibling may be affected, migraine due to this basilar migraine, or we can call this you know, uh, migraine with uh, fall down, that is the basilar migraine that involve the cerebellum. Neurologic disease, suppose Wilson disease. Wilson disease then, then what? That is called what? We just read, no? What is that name, the chart? Let me see. This is multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis, then oligoponto cerebellar degeneration, then cerebellar hemorrhage. These are the neurological disease. Wilson, Wilson disease, these are the adrenoleukodystrophy. These are the cerebellar disease that can cause ataxia. Okay, we have to remember these things. And drug history, very important. Exposure to heavy metal, gas, solvent, and also medication, past medication history. If a child comes to us with ataxia, then how I will proceed? First, I will take the history. Then it is acute or chronic or intermittent. Chronic, it is metabolic or migraine, epilepsy metabolic disease, transient ischemic attack. This is intermittent. Acute, we know. Focal neurological deficit, if present, focal neurological deficit. Then, if focal neurological deficit present, recent history of head trauma or neck trauma, surgery, or increased intracranial pressure. If yes, then it is urgent. You have to do CT scan to see hemorrhage, hydrocephalus, tumor, or 
contusion after contusion i mean minor after any bump there is contusion if there is no focal sign but it is acute you have to think is it meningitis or toxicity if it is meningitis urgent ct scan raised icp with tonsillar herniation and if it is uh, not there is no fever or no nocal rigidity you have to do lumbar puncture sorry neck rigidity nocal uh, neck rigidity present fever present okay you can do urgent ct scan if you suspect there is herniation if there is no herniation then do lumbar puncture i mean we see it by the fundoscopy right if there is no papilloedema we go for lumbar puncture or actually this is the ideal before doing lumbar puncture you should do the ct scan to prevent the herniation okay in any case actually this is good to do the ct scan if there is no fever no nocal rigidity then it is drug okay acute ingestion of any drug so you will do blood test and urine test if no history of drug ingestion but there is recent viral viral illness then suspect post infection that is cerebellar ataxia this is the varicella enterovirus if no viral illness then think about labyrinth infection guanberry actually it is not true labyrinthitis also has upper rti guanberry has gastrointestinal gastrointestinal diarrhea okay clostridium difficile so this is not true that no recent illness this is not true okay if any recent illness think about acute cerebellar ataxia labyrinthitis guanberry okay okay so any question now chronic we will do ct scan first okay because it can be hydrocephalus and tumor and it can be hereditary so we will do genetic testing if it is hereditary so this is the chart for acute intermittent and chronic ataxia we will do work up the investigation work up okay these are the boxes taken from different books like from mark betty and something so differential diagnosis of acute ataxia we already read this thing differential diagnosis of acute ataxia intermittent ataxia chronic ataxia okay and another is cherry malformation type 1 what do you mean by type 1 type 1 only has herniation of the cerebellum but there is no meningomyelocele absent meningomyelocele this is type 1 and type 2 has associated meningomyelocele okay this is type am i correct type 1 and type 2 cherry malformation okay and also spastic cp and cerebellar agenesis these are the chronic non progressive cause now common cause of acute acute cerebellar ataxia drug and gbs now what are the red flag of ataxia this can be asked in the exam that what are the red flag of ataxia if ataxia is associated with neck rigidity fever that means meningitis if there is history of drug if ixol brain tumor i mean papilloedema early morning vomiting this is the red alert neuroblastoma that is opsoclonus myoclonus red alert cerebrovascular accident red alert intracranial hemorrhage there will be sudden and severe post headache post headache and there will be pinpoint pupil if it is spontane hemorrhage post headache spontane hemorrhage there will be unconsciousness and nerve injury cranial nerve injury these are the life threatening or red flags of acute ataxia drug and toxin that may cause ataxia we know anti dip, anti that is called anti seizure drug i mean anti convulsant anti depressant and sedative hypnotic phenytoin alcohol carbamazepine benzodiazepine tricyclic anti depressant so remember anti histam anti depressant anti sedative sedative hypnotic and anti convulsive drug these three groups mainly cause ataxia also heavy metals okay dexamphetamine dextromethorphan sorry dextromethorphan heavy metal lead ethylene glycol alcohol phenothiazine okay fine these are the drug cause now here let me see 
I think we cannot do this thing so much. Okay, let's skip. Okay, so this is the dysdiadocokinesias sign. This is the finger nose test, first pointing test. And gates, see the tandem, how we see the tandem gate. And this is the position sense. This is called pronator drift. Pronator drift. And this is dysmetria, first pointing. And this is rebound phenomena, as Dr. Tahir said. You will, uh, you will hold the child's hand away from the body. And suddenly you will release. The child will hit own face. These things we will not do, actually. This is rebound phenomena, OK? And this is nystagmus. How you will test for nystagmus? OK, we finished. Any points? Now anyone wants to discuss or any suggestion? OK. I think it was good. Uh, learning was good, right? Everyone is sleeping or no? <laughs> I think Dr. Kumana, it was very good, uh, but it would be a morning on the day of discussion. You just upload the topic so that uh, everyone should go at least a bit uh, into the reading uh, to gain maximum. I put in the group today that it will be neurological clinical. Now we are doing neurological clinical. Yesterday I put that it will be history. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, like if you say that we are going to discuss today uh, cranial nerves. Or okay, I got it. Like I this, I mean, uh, a bit pinpoint, a bit pinpoint. Okay, okay, I got it. Okay, then. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Tamana, uh, I want to ask whether uh, like uh, you post regularly about meetings on this vision group. Because I think I'm not in your group and this is the first time I'm attending. So I wanted to ask you. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, our today. Next day we will discuss history taking and communication. Okay. Because we are doing today. I was planning to see some video of gate, but actually this is uh, not the right time for here. It's too late. 1130. Yeah. It's too late for Nami now. So next day, uh, we will try to see some videos of neurology. We will continue neurology for next seven, eight days. Um, Hello, uh, I can't hear you. Hello. Yeah, I, I think Dr. Tamanda, she's asking for adding in the group, but I think your group is already complete. So we'll try to post in every group in which we are added. I will give the link, OK? Plus, please message me if you have my number. This is my number. If you have my number, just message me in the WhatsApp. Okay, I have uh, three groups. I will add you one of the group. Anyone is interested because, you know, sometimes I forget to post in all the groups. Sometimes I be, became very busy that I post within 30 minute notice that I'm free. Okay, this is my number. I'm giving everyone plus uh, 88. Eight. Okay, let me write in the chat. Okay, plus 88. Uh, this is my number. Anyone who is interested, 0171 okay? This is my number. I have uh, three groups total, so I will add you one of the group. Okay, any more suggestions? Okay, okay, thank you. From next day, we will do and communicate from neurology. And after we finish neurology, we will go to the, like, cardiovascular, then we will go respiratory, like this, one system, Okay, and exact topic I may not give, but uh, this is the this is the protocol. I mean, we will do neurology for the next seven eight days. Okay, and the next topic from this book I'm telling you, next topic is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Okay, this one Gower sign positive, so this is Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and next topic will be. Uh, see, let me see. Oh, this is Dr. the Duchenne. Manna, can you please share this book? Yeah, yeah, I will share. This is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And then this is, this is what? High stepping gait. So this is peripheral neuropathy, high stepping gait. Okay, peripheral neuropathy. This, that will be charcot Mary tooth. And then uh, this is GBS, Weinberry syndrome, chronic inflammatory GBS. See, in acute GBS, we will not find in exam. 
because acute condition there is respiratory problem so we will not find the acute gbs but chronic gbs that is called chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy this is a chronic gbs you can find in exam hall okay and uh, but in bangladesh we get the case of acute gbs okay and see this is the Mm, this is CP, okay, CP. So now our next topic will be DMD, GBS, peripheral neuropathy. These three topics we will discuss in our next class. And history taking, I don't, I did not see the topic. I will show you the history topic station, okay? Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Let me see the chats. I did not see the chat. Okay, please add me the clinical group, okay? Mark Betty, fifth nerve is mentioned to ask patient if baby can... Chew, yeah, or swallow. Oh, fifth nerve can chew. Okay, if less than one year of age, the startle reflex of the eighth nerve. Okay, yes, okay. And, uh, um, okay, Dr. Ripa said one is static, other is dynamic. What is that, Dr. Ripa? Static and dynamic test. In this case, we got to test fifth nerve sensation on both sides of the face and not only leave at corneal, okay, with the muscle of mastic. So important to expose the neck in cranial. Yeah. Actually, sometimes they wear the scarf intentionally. This is very important, you know, sometimes they hide the scar mark behind the neck by the hair and behind the ear. These are the very hidden sites like axilla, axilla, neck, behind the ear and the, and the skull. This thing I forgot to tell you, the skull examination in neurology, like S-K-U-L, you know, skull examination in neurological case, it has five S, five S, like scar, size, shape, suture, scar, size, shape, suture, this, uh, there are a lot, suture and shunt, shunt, yeah, five S in the skull examination. And I think to decrease reuptake of neurotransmission by cooling. Oh, this is the, ah, oh, this is the E. Uh, this is called what test? Ice, ice pack. Yeah, ice pack test. Because when patient take rest improve, yeah, yeah. So this myasthenia gravis, they have ice pack test also. You'll put the ice pack and the muscle will response because of the acetylcholine will give some rest. Ice test is useful for tosis. An ice pack is applied for the affected upper eyelid for two to five minutes. A positive test is the improvement of tosis by more than two millimeter or more. Okay. This transient improvement of tosis is due to the cold decrease the acetylcholine esterase activity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, stridor. Okay. Dr. Ripa says stridor is important in myasthenia, congenital myasthenia. Yes. Ah, country newspaper. When? Country newspaper. Oh, they cannot look down. Country newspaper. Paynard syndrome is a condition that affects the eye. Okay, we read the Paynard syndrome. Pupil not responding. Okay. Okay. Frederick ataxia, gait is high stepping. Yeah, because Frederick ataxia means peripheral nerve is injured. So there is high stepping gait. Peripheral neuropathy. So there is high stepping gait. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for lots of uh, useful discussion we did. Okay, and next meeting I will announce. Mostly it will be on Monday because I have two days in class, two days I have duty. So four days I'm busy. I only three days I left in a week. So uh, we'll see. Most probably it will be in Monday. Let's see if I'm free. Tomorrow we can do one session. Okay, thank you.